It's August 3rd. A good Tuesday morning to you, and welcome back to Real Talk Live. Ryan Jesperson here with you alongside Sarah Hoyles and Samuel Brooks. We hope you had a great long weekend, if you observed the long weekend. And a shout-out to everybody that was that was working shift work or that didn't take the time to relax. People that just that kept on hammering away at whatever it is you hammer away at. Welcome back, and it's good to get... Uh, back to normal, so to speak. Coming up in 10 minutes or so, we'll check in with our good friend, Supriya Duvetti, uh, political commentator. Uh, she, she's uh, she's done traditional media for a long time. You see her on all the panels on power and politics and everything else. And, and she reached out to me a few days ago and she said, hey, Ryan Jesperson, she said, can you please explain Alberta to me, buddy? And uh, it, it kicked off this firestorm of of commentary, of course, of, of uh, a whole bunch of people from Ontario, bum, 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 willing to explain Alberta to her. And then a whole bunch of people from Alberta pushing back and then people from B.C. chiming in. And what she did really was kickstart a national conversation. We'll find out exactly why she was so curious about Alberta. Plus, I want to ask her what she makes of a of a fun, unscientific, unofficial informal Twitter poll that I conducted over the weekend asking Canadian conservatives to chime in on who they'd most like to see leading their party into the next federal election, which we know is coming. We're expecting, you know, to see an election call in the next week or so from the prime minister. Nothing's guaranteed, but all signs point to go. Now, people were people were, uh, you know, lamenting. People were protesting my poll saying, well, you're going to get people that aren't conservatives chiming in on this probably. You're going to get people trolling and messing with the results. Yeah, maybe you missed a whole bunch of options. Definitely true. One of the things I take a bit of issue with, Sarah, is that uh, Twitter polls, they only give you up to four options. That's right. You have only four options so to offer folks. It's, it's lousy, really, is what it is, <laughs> because you've you got to go Aaron O'Toole. Obviously, he's the leader of the party. That is who is leading the Conservative Party of Canada into the next election. People saying, well, you know, Stephen Harper, if Stephen Harper would come back, he'd sort all this out. We, we need Stephen Harper back. So you're going to include him. Pierre Polyev is making a whole bunch of noise, basically releasing his own videos and his own campaign material. And it's, I think, quite obvious that that he believes that he should be or could one day lead the party. Mm. Uh, you'll remember he dropped out early in the leadership race for reasons unknown. And then Jason Kenney, I thought, was one that was interesting to throw in. People often allege that, you know, they believe that Jason Kenney has federal political aspirations. In other words, a return to federal politics. So I thought I'd throw him in. But we had a bunch of write-in votes. Um, People people were saying, well, you know, what about Lisa Raitt? What about Ron Ambrose? Uh, What about uh, Michelle Rempel-Garner? What about Michael Chong? What about, you right? and there's several other options. So we could do maybe kind of a, a follow-up poll, which could be interesting. But of those four, we'll reveal the results. Uh, more than 3,000 votes. We'll reveal the results with Supriya Duvetti coming up in just a little bit. Later on in the show, this is, I think, going to be a fascinating conversation about daylight saving time. Because most people really don't understand what's going on, including me. I had to Google... Before we went on today, before we started doing the show, I went and Googled. I was like, when is it? Are we in it now? When does it stop? All people know is spring forward and fall back. That's what people know. When it comes to keeping daylight saving time, people will say, well, hang on. What does that mean? Does that mean we're staying where we are now? Does that mean we go where we were before? And I'm going, yeah, I'm with you. Who the hell knows? So we have another unscientific, unofficial Twitter poll going on right now, and you can find it if you follow me on Twitter at Ryan Jesperson. I would imagine we've pushed it out probably from our Real Talk RJ you account. You betcha. It's retweeted. Which we encourage you to follow. It's 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 slowly but surely building a follower base, but I know we could do better if we really hammered it home that we would love for people to follow our new account at Real Talk RJ. Hammer it. Hammer it. Go ahead and give us a follow. Maybe we'll check in on our unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll right now just to get a sense of, of where people are at. So we posted about a half an hour ago. We got about 540 votes here. Uh, 56% say drop it, drop daylight saving time. Uh, about 18 and a half, let's call it 19% say keep it, and 25% say they don't care. Now, there have been some good points made. For example, Troy chimes in and he says, well, your question is, is phrased kind of weird. Right. He says, I don't know how to answer your question because I want to keep the daylight saving time hours, but I want to drop the idea of switching between. And he makes a fair point. 
Um, I'm glad that he left a comment. That's one of the great things about Twitter polls is if you, if you take issue with the phrasing of the question or you don't see the result or the option that you like, you can always just leave a comment. So Troy would like to spring forward and then stay there. Stick it. Stick spring, the landing. Spring forward and stick it. Uh, I think probably what some people will say, if you do that in certain parts of the world, including, you know, if we're going to be talking about Alberta, the reason why we'll talk about Alberta in this context is because daylight saving time is 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 alleged to be planned to wind up on this this ballot, this referendum, if you will, uh, this October when when Albertans go to the polls as part of the municipal election. What do you want to do? What do you want to see the government do with daylight saving time? One of the issues would be that you would spring forward, stay there. And then in the winter months, the sun would come up at about 10 in the morning. Oh. Right. So you get a sense of sort of the, the trade offs that you might have to deal with. Dr. Michael Anta will join us from the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. That's coming up in about 40 minutes time. A professor in the Department of Psychology. He studies again. Uh, I think it would be a great band name circadian rhythms he's a he's he studies circadian rhythms and uh he's the vice president of the canadian society of chronobiology and so we'll find out what some of the trade-offs might be from a health perspective if there could be and then you and then you'll hear from other people for example i've heard that dairy farmers argue that daylight saving time can throw off their cows it can throw off the milking rhythms it can throw i don't know if that's legit or not but I would imagine that real talkers will have plenty to say about that. Well, they don't have watches, right? Yeah, they don't, you know. Cows uh, don't really have watches. But they, they so. go by they go by the, how they're fed. That's what, right. That's what draws them into the milkers these days. All these like digital tech driven. I mean, it's the milking science now is fascinating. Have you ever can I can I like go for a second as a city slicker and describe what I've seen? And my cousin's oh, I can't farm. wait. And then well, this people is are really, going to be like... It's amazing. So a milking cow will walk in so they can, they, they'll make, they'll milk up to twice a day, but not more. And, uh, and what draws them in is food. Mm. So they come into the kind of, uh, you know, imagine like a big, long, sort of a phone booth type thing. Uh, What's a phone with, a, booth? with like, yeah, exactly. With, <laughs> with like a trough at the front. When it comes in, it scans, it knows exactly which cow it is of the hundreds on the farm. It knows which one it is. And each cow can have a specific diet customized for what it needs. This is really fascinating stuff. So it comes in, it scans the cow, it knows which cow like it is. Like by its retina? Well, what, however it scans. I think it yeah. actually scans the udder, to be honest with you. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but it knows which one it is. And of course, they're all tagged and everything, but it scans it, it dispenses what feed mix that cow is supposed to have, and then as it eats, as it feeds... The milkers, like the, the things go on, they, they affix themselves and they milk the cow. And then the cow goes and goes on its merry way. And it can do that up to twice a day. Cows will try to get in a third time to feed more. And the machine will boot them out. It won't let them go. It's really fascinating stuff. It's amazing. It's not like, you know, the farmer's kids on a little stool at 4.30 in the morning wiping the sleep out of their eyes, like milking it into a bucket anymore. That's well, that's not the way it goes. Lost jobs, man. Lost Fascinating jobs. Fascinating stuff. Look at that. People being displaced that's everywhere right. by, by automation, automation. By automation. In about an hour and 20 minutes from now, Dr. Amy Cardinal Christensen will join us. Uh, this is a fascinating gig that Amy's got, a fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service, also happens to be a Métis woman, and she's going to bring us a, a really unique perspective, one that we've been looking forward to here on the show for quite some time as we talk about wildfires, the the indigenous side of historical fire management, or let's call it landscape management, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that from Dr. Cardinal Christensen. Amy will join us again, as mentioned, in about an hour and 20 minutes from now. Sapria Dovetti, in just a moment... Right now, we want to remind you that our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park pride themselves on their contributions and their commitments to community. And they've been in touch with us. They said for the month of August, as the devastation of Canada's residential schools continues to unfold, we felt the need to educate ourselves by reaching out to friends within the Indigenous community. We wanted to align ourselves with the group who would benefit from a month of community commitment. And so for the month of August, there are six locations. Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road are going to donate a dollar from every cone sold to the Wakutuin Society. 
the Wakutuin Society. We're going to be telling you a whole bunch more about them through this month. Not only just residential school survivors, but cancer fighters, too. And they host retreats for healing for indigenous women. Uh, this fundraising initiative is going to be amazing. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing Real Talkers step up in a big way. Sarah Hoyles does a great job as the producer of this show, keeping me on track and reminding me that I should probably mention that our title sponsor is the team at Bitcoin. Well, they're entitled to the first mention every day. I'm sure they won't mind on that one. They'll probably give me one get out free card here. That's exactly right. On that one. What an exciting day it was for Bitcoin. Well, on Friday, they went public. They're the first publicly traded Bitcoin ATM company on planet Earth. And congratulations to our friends at Bitcoin. Well, of course, on this show, we never tell you to buy Bitcoin. We never tell you to buy their stock. What we do is, if you have questions, we encourage you to check in with their team. Pay attention to what's going on and make your own informed decisions. You can find more about Bitcoin well under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, it's always such a pleasure to check in with our good friend, Supriya Devetti. You know her from uh, traditional and mainstream broadcast media as a star of political panels from coast to coast to coast. A good friend of this show, kind enough to join us in the lead off on this short week this Tuesday morning. A good morning to you, my friend. Were you, were you able to chill out over the course of the long weekend? Were you able to get some time in to just relax, recharge, etc.? I wish um, we moved this weekend. So I am speaking to you from the only corner I have in my house where there aren't boxes piled um, in back of me. In fact, I have strategically paced, placed all the boxes in this room on the other side of my laptop so nobody can really see. Wow. Um, so you're the in the new place, nice. not the old place. You're in the new place. I am. We are in the new place finally. And you've already uh, got so your Wi Fi going. I, I had to. Right. Otherwise, there's no work that gets done. How do, how do you do in, in the course of moves? Moving to me, we, we've, we've got friends at Alta moving in storage and their whole thing is they're like, we take the stress out of moving. And I can relate to that because I, I would literally stay in a house for five or six years longer than I wanted to just so I didn't have to move. I can't stand it. Yeah, I mean, you know, taking the stress out of moving is one thing, but I don't think anyone can take the stress out of having a two year old at home that's just looking to eat packing peanuts and taking the, you know, the tape gun and whatever else is around. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm all for taking the stress out of move, but uh, I don't think you can do that logistically when you have a toddler. <laughs> well, congratulations on the new place. Super exciting. Obviously, you reached out to me back on uh, July 28th. This is, I, I guess, approximately a week ago, just less than a week ago. And you said, I need somebody to explain Alberta to me. <laughs> Jespo, you up for the task, buddy? And uh, j just asking if I was up for the task, it got about 900 people to like it and a whole bunch of people to chime in. Did you have any idea what you were getting into when you asked the question? No, I thought I was just tweeting my buddy uh, <laughs> yeah. who was, you know, born and raised in Alberta and knows all things Alberta. And I was just, you know, the tweet stemmed from my own, I guess, curiosity as to, why Alberta was going the route that it had chosen to go with respect to COVID measures, right? And I think myself was along with a whole host of other people had a few questions and look, I grew up and I'm from Quebec, right? I, I've only really lived in Ontario for like seven or eight years now. And I have a lot of people that frequently ask me to Quebec explain things to them that are in the rest of Canada. And I think Alberta and Quebec are both rather unique provinces in this great country that often uh, if you don't live there and if you aren't, you know, steeped into the the everyday sort of going ons and, and, the, and the culture that you often have uh, questions. And I am, you know, not, no different than many people across this country that have a lot of questions. Yeah, this is and, and trying to explain Alberta these days is tough because I'm not sure that that people in Alberta quite understand Alberta yet. I think that the premier is trying to get a sense of of the dynamic in Alberta right now. And you, you look at, at how his support has has been languishing and how, how he's been struggling to, to maintain support even among his base. One of the really interesting things about that is he's losing it in two directions. Right. You'll have sort of moderate or you might describe them as progressive conservatives that are that are that, that have lost faith in the premier for one reason. And then and then you'll have the I hate to be so generally speaking, but I mean, you know, let's cut to the chase. The right wingers who are pretty ticked off at the premier as well because they feel like he's done too much through the pandemic. So he's been stuck between a, a, a rock and a hard place. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the next number of months. How would you say Alberta's perceived from where you are? 
in Ontario right now? Well, I mean, I would say that my entire feed when Alberta had made, you know, the announcement that they did on on July 28th, I think you said it was, um, was filled with public health experts and docs really decrying the move. And then a lot of, you know, political eggheads or nerds were basically saying that, okay, yeah, this is a little weird, but I guess it sort of makes sense given uh, Al- Al- Alberta is more penchant for, I'm going to use very cliched terms here, but for things like, you know, freedom and from getting away from the tyranny of public health measures, which I, I, you know, to a degree, I of course understand, but what I continually fail to really understand here is that we are in a situation right now in this country, at least where we are awash in vaccines, right? We are very lucky to have access to safe and effective vaccines that are at the red, that are at readily available to anybody who's willing to get them. The problem with all of this is that every kid under the age of 12 is unvaccinated. And so my issue, and I had stated this, you know, pretty recently on a, on a power and po- politics panel that I was on, is that if you have a virus with multiple known animal reservoirs, which you know COVID does have multiple known animal reservoirs. And you are letting a virus, you know, spread around uh, a certain population with a good chunk of that population being unvaccinated. Um, you get into sort of dicey territory here because you're just giving the the virus the opportunity to do what viruses tend to do, which is to evolve. And you know, with Delta, we already have. Uh, COVID in a more transmissible and a more deadly form uh, as compared to the OG or original COVID that was out there. And it just sort of worries me that we're only really going to react or do anything um, to sort of temper the situation once we already have kids in pediatric intensive care beds. And I'm sure I'm not the only person that wants to avoid that scenario or that situation. And I think there are some unhelpful comparisons that have been made out there. Like I don't think comparing Alberta to Florida or to Louisiana or to another state that has, you know, very low vaccina- vaccination rates and very high test positivity rates. I don't think that's necessarily helpful because it's it's not a, an apt comparison um, because even though Alberta does have, I think, one of the lower uh, rates of vaccination uptake in the province, it's still leagues and leagues ahead of mm-hmm. where the U.S. is. So, you know, I, I don't want to sound too alarmist by, by, by any of this, but I just want us to be mindful of the fact that every kid you see out there is under, that is under 12 is unvaccinated and they don't have the choice to get vaccinated right now. And as schools, you know, return and we see a lot more kids mixing and mingling, um, it, it's, it, we're, we're bound to see an uptick in cases and amongst kids, you know, with things like long COVID being still, you know, reviewed and we're looking at the data, it's A, worrying, and B, the most worrying aspect to me, again, as as a layperson just watching this who, you know, isn't a, an MD or isn't a public health expert, is the fact that there is some evidence for neurotropism when it comes to COVID, meaning that it can infect nerve cells. And that is worrying to me, and that is reason enough, quite frankly, for me not wanting to roll the dice on something like this, but I guess the folks in charge in Alberta have a different mindset. And and again, to be fair to, to Alberta, my understanding is Saskatchewan did something very similar a couple of weeks prior to what Alberta did. Um, and I, I don't think they got the same sort of reaction in the media that yeah. Um, Alberta was facing. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. And and I think, you know, probably a couple of the big ones with regards to Alberta's policy, um, the fact that that testing numbers or case numbers won't be made public. Although a lot of people are making the argument, too, and I'm, I'm, tr- I'm re- remaining as open minded as possible. And you want to hear different perspectives on this. People are saying that case numbers are not relevant anymore. What's relevant now are hospitalizations and ICUs and and, and, and maybe a more astute uh, government communications team might have been able to steer the conversation there to sort of prepare the public for this departure from policy that people have, have become accustomed to. And that obviously, I think the you know, if, if you're not. Uh, making uh, testing or public testing available like it has been in past and you're not making testing data or case data available then you can't really expect people to isolate if they're covid positive especially if they don't know if they are and so that was lifted and that's obviously the big one that one to me is the huge one that make people concerned there's no longer a mask mandate for example on public transit if i'm going to take my little guy on the city bus how do i know that there aren't two people that are covid positive either knowingly or not 
that are out there. It's been interesting to see in Alberta, Sapria, because you've got a, a series of rallies, and I'm sure I know that they've been making national news to all as much as some people are trying to discount these rallies. Oh, there's not as many people as they say there, or whatever the case may be. People are showing up day after day after day outside the McDougal Center in Calgary, outside the the legislature building uh, in Edmonton, hundreds of people with placards and signs saying essentially enough is enough. And then you've got the the premier's team, right? His issues managers and his his comms staff that are, that are essentially saying some people just never want COVID to end. You know, they they kind of like COVID. They've kind of built yeah. some of their identity around COVID and 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 they're writing off or discounting these public demonstrations. I don't know a single person who doesn't want COVID to end. You know, if you speak to anybody who's in public health or is on or is a clinician that is right now on the front lines of a healthcare institution, I, I, I know a lot of these people and every single one of them wants COVID to end. Nobody wants to see this continue. The, the issue that we have, of course, is that there are huge inequities when it comes to vaccines. And, you know, in, in Canada, as, as I've already mentioned, and in North America more, more generally, um, we're, we're, we, we have options, right? They don't have a ton of options in the rest of the world. So as the rest of the world is continuing to grapple with this pandemic and is continuing to see, you know, unchecked spread in a lot of these places, we're all at risk. And that's what I think, you know, is, is really the hardest part of all of this is to really drill home is that, it, it, in a society that is so hell bent on individualism and individual rights, you know, you have to do certain things for the collective good, like wearing a mask, right? Um, you mentioned not having any mask mandates on public transit. Well, how the fuck are we supposed to keep our kids safe in that situation, right? I mean, you just said maybe, you know, you can afford to not take public transit and, you know, you, you and your little guy can go in your car to get from point A to point B. But for a lot of people, that's just not an option. And I think that that's another thing that has been exposed even within you know Canada and within our, our own societies is that a lot of the inequities that have already existed and have persisted you know throughout various governments um, are now just being completely exacerbated by by the pandemic and by the conditions that have led us to this and and it's just it's it's a real shame and I think we have an opportunity to try and look out for the folks who are unable to look out for themselves right now, like those, you know, that are unvaccinated uh, 12 and under, but those that are also going in day in, day out to work um, a public facing jobs uh, that have to deal with, you know, the kinds of people that you're talking about that are going to these rallies. And I, I know they're, they're common, not just in Alberta, but really across the country. I mean, in, in, in Toronto, there is almost like a weekly standing demonstration that happens with anti-maskers and, and anti-vaxxers alike. So it's, it's a real issue. This is uh, you talk about these unique cultures in Alberta and Quebec. And uh, to a certain degree, I, I do agree with you. And I think that, you know, not not for everyone in Alberta, but for many words like freedom really ring true. And and politicians that that seek to uh, infuse some emotion or some passion into something will will invoke that word right you know why why is Alberta why is it so important that alberta be first to drop these restrictions you know if, if it doesn't come across as prudent why would it make sense well because alberta is big on freedom and you may sit there from ontario where you are or someone from new brunswick or british columbia and say well what? that doesn't really make sense freedom uh like not <laughs> isolating if you're covid positive i'm not sure if i would you know hold that up as kind of a bastion of freedom but the word is big for a lot of people and and i'm not sure that you can quite explain that culture like you saw it though sapria if people want to read through uh that Twitter thread again from July 28th when you asked me to explain Alberta you know you got piled on by some people some of them weren't very nice uh the, just the simple fact that you would ask to try to understand the psyche or the ethos or the zeitgeist if you want to call it of Alberta right now people were furious that someone from Toronto would even ask Oh, yeah. And it gets doubled because I'm from Quebec. Right. And I think a, a good chunk of people know I'm from Quebec. So, of course, the reasoning then turns into or the Twitter response is just like something, something oil, something, something equalization payments to Quebec. So, you know, F off or, or whatever. And it's just none of that helps. Right. In terms of trying to garner a better understanding of one side of the country to another. But, you know, I get it. I, I you were talking about freedom and how freedom is kind of like a, a catchphrase or a buzzword that, that means something very, very distinct 
distinct and very particular to Albertans. I mean, coming from Quebec, I can tell you that being a distinct society certainly means something very special and very different in Quebec than it does to the rest of Canada. So, I mean, I get it, um, but I still don't really have an answer as to why Alberta felt like it had to move in the direction that it did. And, you know, I don't think I'm ever really going to perhaps get that answer. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly hope that I'm wrong because I don't want to see uh, Delta wreak havoc on, on, on the school systems uh, as we all return to school. But I think it's, you know, somewhat inevitable. And given the fact that the R value right now in, in Alberta is above one, um, it, it's, it's worrying. And it was above one when they lifted some of those uh, other restrictions. So I, I don't really know what the fallback plan is here, the contingency plan for if you start to see a, a rise in cases. And I think, you know, it's playing with fire. Inevitably, you're going to get burned. I think I think that the premier and his government, I think, have a narrative. And I think they're doing their best to manifest that narrative, right? That COVID's over, that it's going to be the best summer ever. And, um, and if you can keep some of those numbers from being in front of people and really remove people's awareness or understanding, if you don't know how many new cases, and again, with prevalent, vaccinations cases are less relevant but if you don't have the sure. data in front of you it's tougher to push back it's tougher for people to know what's going on and, and i mean this is this is when politics meets that intersection with public health right and it's it's ground that makes a lot of people uncomfortable before we run out of time i want to ask you about this are you expecting to see let's say within a week from it's 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 august 3rd so let's say by august 10th a week from now are you expecting to see the prime minister call an election at some point soon I do. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think we're, you know, all but heading for a federal election and I would expect it to be called within the next week, if not within the next week, then within the next 10 days. Um, I think, you, you know, it'll be interesting to see how things play out on the campaign. Uh, you know, uh, let me insert my cliched phrase of campaigns matter. Uh, but as of right now, I mean, the government, the liberal government federally is in a good position to try and make the case for, for their majority. And I'll be really interested to see how Jagmeet Singh and Aaron O'Toole uh, react on the campaign trail and if they're able to rally uh, some Canadians to vote for them. You've got Jagmeet Singh saying that, you know, he thinks that the governor general should deny the prime minister's yeah. request to dissolve parliament, yeah, which, which is Dude's supposed to be a lawyer. Kind Come of on, ridiculous. Get out of here. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. It's not how it works. Uh, and then, and then you've got this interesting point. So Canada has just surpassed Israel when it comes to vaccinations, which is obviously huge. This was just from a couple of days ago. Uh, Canada surpassing Israel on August first. Uh, for numbers of fully vaccinated citizens, uh, says health reporter Eric Tobel, a very high bar. Uh, congratulating Canada on that. You'll remember Conservative MP out of Calgary, Michelle Rempel Garner, said it could be 2030 before Canadians were going to be vaccinated. Now Conservatives are saying that the Prime Minister is being opportunistic, uh, calling the election right now. Do you blame him? Is the timing good? Obviously, he wants a majority government. Languishing in minority can be difficult to get things done. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't blame any government for trying to seize an opportunity. And I mean, political parties are going to be political. That's just there's no other way around that. Right. Um, I think what will be interesting to see uh, is, you know, if we're looking at an election being called within the next 10 days or so, as I as I had already said, what does that put the election actual day at? And so I think it's going to be interesting if we do start to see a bit of an uptick in cases. I'll be very interested to see the dynamic between the provinces and the federal government, um, because I think there's going to be a little bit of a blame game going on as to who is responsible for that rise in, in, in cases towards the end of September. And that, to me, will be really interesting. The other interesting thing is and, you know, Ryan, you and I sort of got a front row seat to this uh, during the 2019 election. But, you know, the vote percentages of like X party has like 30 percent of the vote. The other party has like 25 percent of the vote. That's somewhat meaningless because we need to be, you know, thinking in terms of seat count. And so I know the polling lately has been quite good for the federal liberals. But in seat count wise, I mean, I don't know if they're necessarily there yet. So uh, of crossing that majority threshold um, comfortably. So it'll be interesting to see how that sort of plays out throughout the campaign as well. Andrew Shear did all right. I mean, generally speaking, in the, in the last election, more votes than the liberals overall. I know yeah. that people, you know, Canadians don't talk about popular vote as much. And obviously they dominated the prairies. Um, it sort of uh, ran up the score a little bit in the prairies, uh, gaining seats as well from 95 seats to 121 
it'll be interesting to see how the conservatives fare under Aaron O'Toole. I pushed out over the course of the weekend just as a talking point leading up to you checking in with us, Sapria. I asked Canadian conservatives on Twitter, who'd you most like to lead your party into the next federal election? Had about 3,800 votes. And as you can see, and, and people will say, ah, non-conservatives were chiming in on this, or how do you know this? It's not a scientific poll at all. It's just an interesting one to put out there. Pierre Poliev with 38% of the vote, followed by Stephen Harper at 31. Aaron O'Toole, of course, the leader of the conservatives, uh, gleaning 18% of that vote in Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney, 13, 13% in this hypothetical exercise. Does it surprise you? A little, but it also sort of mirrors, I think, what some of the other polling, like actual scientific polling firms have come out with, right, in terms of preferred PM. I mean, O'Toole tracks uh, behind unsure, right? And so th that's not great. I mean, the optimistic spin to that, of course, is that that's a lot of room for Mr. O'Toole to be able to grow, right? And I think there's still a sizable chunk of Canadians who have yet to be really exposed to Aaron O'Toole. And I think the Conservatives are obviously going to try quite hard to, to make that good first positive impression on those chunk of Canadians. But I think just generally, you know, it's, it's hard to be a capital C Conservative right now in this environment, particularly when you're seeing and we're inundated with news from the states um, about how Republican governors and how, you know, Republican legislatures are, are reacting. And I think some of the culture war stuff that the conservatives on this side of the border tend to, you know, mirror and try to copycat, fight their way into from the southern side of things just really isn't helpful to them, particularly when um, we're in a pandemic and science and evidence kind of matters a little bit more than like campus free speech bullshit that, you know, your average uh, voter in Canada isn't really too concerned with right now. A little later on in this show, we're going to get into the results of our most recent question of the week um, presented by our friends at Y Station. And uh, we had close to 800 people chiming in on how they feel uh, or where they're at with regards to their own sustainable energy goals and people talking mm -hmm. about, you know, how they're pursuing that themselves or talking about some of the barriers that are standing in the way. And then there are some really interesting questions, which we'll get into on. And we got some really interesting insight on, on the role that people believe government should play when it comes to policy and subsidies and initiatives and all sorts of things. Um, I know that, of course, Aaron O'Toole put his neck out there a little bit earlier this year talking about a conservative climate plan and I mean, geez, where you are, Sapria, in, in urban Toronto, that's one of the battlegrounds for the Conservatives. You could say the same thing about Greater Vancouver and, and other big urban centers where the Conservatives, I know, will hope to gain some ground. Political scientists polling, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence shows us that one of the reasons why Andrew Scheer's Conservatives faltered in 2019 was because the general public didn't perceive there to be a legitimate, meaningful climate plan. Do you think Aaron O'Toole's done enough on this? And how much of an issue do you think? I mean, obviously, I think the pandemic will be election issue number one. Uh, if you disagree, I'd love to hear it. But but where do you think that environmental plans will come in? I mean, I think they're going to be top of mind for a good chunk of voters. And, you know, I'm now a suburban wine mom for all intents and purposes. And I can tell you that a few weeks ago when the air quality was rather bad here in the GTA because of wildfire smoke, um, again, very unscientific, completely anecdata type of evidence. But a bunch of moms were talking on the playground and one of them said that it was, you know, the reason why another kid's asthma was acting up was because of the wildfire smoke. And the conversation kind of turned to, well, it's going to be worse if those Trump wannabes get into power. And I didn't really get into it with any of the moms. I didn't inquire as to whether they meant provincial or federal Trump wannabes or what they actually even really meant by that comment. But I, I mean, I think you're now dealing with a chunk of the population, millennials, who have grown up with knowing that climate change isn't really much of a debate. It's just a fact and we have to act towards it. And given the fact that millennials now are the largest voting demographic in the country, I am a little surprised at conservatives um, not putting forward a more robust climate plan. I, I definitely give Mr. O'Toole a lot of credit for coming out with one to begin with, because I know that probably wasn't easy for him to do. And he's, you know, received uh, a little bit of backlash from his own base on that. Um, but it's it's necessary. It's, it's well past time. And, you know, it's time political parties started to reflect the fact that millennials 
are where you need to gun for our vote and you need to try a little harder, right? And then you did with the boomers and uh, perhaps even some older Gen Xers. And I don't know if we're uh, given the respect that we necessarily, you know, uh, deserve as as a large as the largest voting demographic in this country. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not convinced that that the party faithful are particularly interested in that type of exercise. I, I, maybe I'm being unfair here, but I don't think so. I mean, you, you even look back to previous leadership races within the party. So as, as part of my unofficial unscientific Twitter poll, I had a lot of write-ins, right? I was, I was griping earlier that Twitter only gives you four options. And so I thought O'Toole's got to be on the list, obviously. Stephen Harper, for obvious reasons, has to be on there because there's a lot of chatter online. We need to go back to Harper. Harper needs to okay. come back. And then I thought, well, who will be the other two? Poliev is kind of doing the non-campaign campaign for leadership, right? Uh, you know, he's releasing a lot of his own videos and, and, and driving a lot of the conversation, mm -hmm. I think, at least among the real politicos. And I thought, well, who should be number four on the list? And I kind of hummed and hawed and thought, who belongs on there? Ron Ambrose says she doesn't want it. Um, you know, Michelle Rempel Garner has never thrown her hat in the ring in a leadership race i think it might be kind of uh, that that fourth spot seemed valuable and there's so much talk in alberta how people believe that kenny ultimately wants to get back onto the federal landscape so i thought i'd make him number four but we had a ton of write-ins uh there was a lot of none of the above uh, from people purporting to be conservatives right saying i'm right. a conservative but i don't like those four choices they seem very similar quite frankly which is fair criticism uh, several people mentioned lisa rate i had a bunch of people writing in michael chong but michael chong would be one of those that would qualify as more of a quote-unquote progressive conservative and the minute sapria as if i need to tell you two leadership races ago right the minute that he brought up a carbon tax, people flipped their lids. Like it was like stick a fork in the leadership campaign. There was no appetite for it, whether or not it was the smart political move with regards to growing the party. Yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, there was also he received quite a bit of criticism for being one of the only conservatives in that leadership race to be outspoken uh, in favor of M103, right? That federal motion to condemn Islamophobia. And he, 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 got, it, he got it quite... Uh, readily from from his own base on that front. Uh, I love Lisa Rayet. Like I need to disclose that. Like I have like a, a huge girl crush on her, as it were. So I think she'd make an incredible conservative leader. I think there were initially a little bit of uh, griping because I her French. I don't think uh, she's completely bilingual, but I, I think Quebecers would be and other you know Franco um, Canadians would be somewhat sympathetic to anyone who is actively trying to learn French and to try and better themselves on that front so if she were to make another go at it i i think it would be very interesting i remember it takes me back to the i mean my, my my sort of junior high and high school years growing up you know playing basketball with nathan manning and, and hearing all the stories about how his dad preston was working so hard to get his french up to speed right it was so important to get the french up to speed so the the reform party could be taken more seriously or seen as a viable option in Eastern Canada, I'd be curious to see when, when you look back under the Harper conservatives and people have their own theories. I'm sure you do, too, about sort of that that stifling sense of leadership. There's different leadership styles, obviously. Some of them encourage the heirs apparent. Right. And, and some of them kind of tend to hold them down. But if you take a look at that conservative front bench uh, from from several years ago, it was actually quite formidable politically yeah. right i mean with, with like, uh, just off the top of my head and i'm sure you can add a ton of names to this but you think like ronna ambrose jason kenny john baird peter mckay uh you know i mean the list like you, you go on and on and on and on and i'm sure i'll think of more but but now you kind of go if if not aaron o'toole really who I mean, I think the answer is Pierre, no? And, and, and I, my understanding was the reason why he didn't go at it this time around was because his kid was too young. Um, you know, that may change in, a, a, this would have been, what, a, a year and a bit ago already. So I, I have no inside information on this, obviously, but I think the fact that Pierre is perfectly bilingual gives him a, a bit of an edge. And I think he can, you know, rally and corral the base to a degree. And with a little bit more discipline, I think he can probably grow the party's vote. He, Pierre just needs to step out of like, Twitter Pierre um, and meme Pierre, Pierre into like serious politician Pierre to be able to access some of that suburban mom vote that I was referring to earlier. As a, as, as, as a commentator uh, and someone who has no problem grabbing a big bag of popcorn and, and settling in, I, I would suggest that Pierre Polyev 
would give Justin Trudeau a run for his money in any debate. I mean, it would be highly entertaining, if not <laughs> anything else. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, who's who's not for uh, popcorn popping and watching politicos go at it, right? Yeah, exactly. You think that you think federal NDP are going to gain or lose seats this time around? I I don't know, man. I think they I don't want to, you know, I mean, I think they're going to lose. I'm sorry. I just don't think there's any viable option for them in Quebec right now. I think they'll be shut out of a lot of important writings um, in suburban and urban Canada. I mean, I hope for their sake, they're able to make a good go at it. I, I really do like Jagmeet Singh um, as, as a person. And I, th- and I think he is doing an okay job as NDP leader, but you know, they need to decide the NDP that is whether they're going to be a party that's trying to constantly recreate this 2011 orange wave or orange crush, whatever they call it, versus becoming a viable, serious option in more urban and suburban ridings and focusing resources there. Let me ask you in closing, uh, before I let you get back to wh- where do you start, by the way, do you start unpacking? You got to unpack the kitchen boxes <laughs> first, right? Kitchen, kids, laundry. That's where you got yeah, to start. Yeah, for us, I guess. it was kitchen and kids' room right away, yeah. and then everything else sort of just falls into place and, after. And, and then figure out the rest later. We'll let you get back to it. But, but just we we talked to, as part of our series of conversations with the federal leaders, and we've spoken to all of them now, uh, save for Aaron O'Toole. Actually, that's not true. I, I suppose uh, Mr. Blanchette qualifies in a way, and yeah. we'll endeavor to speak with him as well. But Annamie Paul, it was like, 48 hours after we talked to her, all hell broke loose, it seemed, and uh, and trying to make sense now of what's going on. I mean, new I mean, executives of the Green Party describe their new leader as killing the party. She's running into opposition on every front. What does this do to the reputation of the Greens? Does it matter? Is it significant? Have you paid any time uh, paying attention to this story? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it all the time, it seems, anytime I'm on a political panel. So it's getting a lot of airtime. I don't think this is the kind of airtime that the Green Party would hope for this close to a federal election. And I don't know why they're doing this or shooting themselves in the foot in an election where, as you and I have already discussed, environmental issues are going to be top of mind for a whole chunk of voters. And it just, you know, I'd say that they're shooting themselves in the foot over this, but it's more like they're shooting themselves in the genitals because it's just, it's it's nonsensical and it doesn't make any sense. Every party has their infighting and I get that, but you know, you don't air it over social media and you don't have these kinds of fights in public. They're not even trying to pretend like things are, copacetic over there they're not even it's not even like it's unbelievable it's some people aren't digging for dirty laundry that they didn't do a good job hiding they're airing it out they're airing the dirty laundry for everybody to see and it's i just can't imagine what the thought is behind there i mean i you know i I don't know if there's another leader in waiting that they believe will captivate the attention of canadians or maybe i'm missing something on anime paul but to me she kind of came across as somebody that could move the needle a little bit uh, she did well in the interview. She had some interesting ideas. I don't know. Do you have any insight into where it all went yeah. wrong? I mean, look, I've interviewed her before when I used to have my own show in, here in Toronto. And I, I, what I love about Anime is that she doesn't speak in those weird, yeah. truncated political talking points, right? Um, and I, I thought that to be a, an incredible breath of, of fresh air. I just, I, I don't understand what her party is doing. I, I get that they have different views perhaps on party direction but you battle that out behind closed doors you don't you you know shoot your leader behind the back or stab your leader in the back like in in full public view like this and the party right now is in no fighting shape for for an election and i think there are a lot of politicos out there that would argue that the green party given their standing is just getting way too much airtime right now yeah I agree. Uh, we've got some interesting comments on the on the live chat. People now debating, thanks to you, Supriya, uh, whether or not the Green Party is shooting itself in the foot, the genitals, or the head. Um, all, all three are putting a strange thought through my spine as I visualize all three scenarios and circumstances. Uh, it's great. You've got us thinking. You've, you've got our brains churning, which is uh, always the sign of a good conversation. It's always so good to welcome you to the show. Thanks for making time for us. On the heels of moving weekend, no less. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Ryan. You got it. That's Supriya Duveni. Give her a follow on Twitter. Of course, we link to her uh, on our tweet from our official Real Talk Twitter account at Real Talk RJ each and every morning. Yeah, James says they're not shooting themselves in the foot or the junk. They're shooting themselves in the head twice. James believes that I'm supposing he's suggesting that this could be the, the permanent death of that party. 
others of you with your thoughts on uh, the, the, the fortunes of the, the NDP and how they think they'll fare in this next election under Jagmeet Singh. Arnold says he, he's not done a good job as leader. I know we like him, but I'm not sure what people think he's done well. He is a very likable guy. Um, I appreciated his availability on the show. There have been some ideas that have been out there with regards to the NDP, and you kind of sit there and wonder, is, is this the type of direction that a party needs to move? If, if you're trying to convince, I mean, if you're looking there at, at the undecideds, which is essentially what political parties might do, you'd look at the undecideds and the moderates, right? If you're Aaron O'Toole and his team, you're, you're going to say, what's it going to take for us to, to steal votes from the liberals or, or convince those that would have maybe not shown up to vote? Right. There's 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 two types, I think, of of votes up for grabs. Number one, people that voted with tepid enthusiasm for a party, but they would assign their vote elsewhere in future. And those that, quite frankly, didn't vote, they didn't feel inspired or compelled to go out there and and exercise their democratic right. But they would if it was the right leader or the right policy kind of brings us to this referendum that Alberta's looking at, doesn't it? Coming up in October. That's that's the theory behind why Alberta's premier might be wanting to put some of these things, including, you know, rejigging the equalization formula or daylight saving time or what have you. A lot of people say, well, it's because they're, you know, they're, they're trying to find a reason to get people out to the polls. And if you're inclined to say that well, equalization, the formula as it stands is junk and Alberta's getting screwed, then you may be the type of person that also may be inclined to vote for a mayoral candidate or a council candidate that would align politically with the government pushing out the referendum. And so what they're trying to do is stack the numbers and influence the voter turnout. Other people will say, why don't you fasten your tinfoil hat on a little stronger, right? They'll try to dismiss that type of idea. We're always curious to know where you land on this. You can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Hey, a heads up, everybody. Coming up August 20th through 22nd, Canada, and in particular, our home city of Edmonton, Alberta, will play host to the 2021 World Triathlon Championship Finals. This is the pinnacle triathlon event. Edmonton is one of three cities worldwide to have held the World Championships three times. Canada known as or rather Edmonton, known as Canada's Triathlon City. As we revealed to you last week, Edmonton has produced more Olympians than any other city in Canada, welcoming the best and arguably the fittest athletes in the world. They're welcoming spectators in person. There's also a variety of events for all ages and skill levels. Registration is open right now with limited spots. You can check it out at edmonton.triathlon.org. With so many cyclists in the city, they're also holding their inaugural Edmonton Urban Cycling Fondo, presented by Melkor. This is a community race on a closed course through Edmonton's iconic River Valley. That'll go Sunday, August 22nd. More details at edmonton.triathlon.org. If you're getting set to get the heck out of Dodge, we want to remind you right now, you can fly nonstop from Edmonton to Amsterdam With KLM, that starts August 19th. Circle your calendars just over a couple of weeks from right now. While you're there, why not self-park at Jet Set Parking Edmonton? You're not going to get any closer to the departures gates for for the price you're going to pay. You can book online at jetsetparking.com. And if you use the promo code REALTALK, get this. The promo code REALTALK at jetsetparking.com gets you parking for $5 a day. What? $5 a day at the airport for any travel right through to the end of 2022. Jet Set Parking is locally owned. Take my word for it. You'll love them. Let's check in on our unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll this morning. We're asking you how you feel about daylight saving time. We've asked if you want to drop it, keep it, or whether or not you even care. Right now, 56% say drop it, 20% say keep it, 25% say yeah, we don't really care. One in four don't care. Uh, Dr. Michael Antle is a professor in the Department of Psychology at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute at the University of Calgary. And for coming up on 20 years, he's been studying circadian rhythms. He's the VP of the Canadian Society of Chronobiology. We're thrilled to have you here, Dr. Antle. Thanks for making time for us. Good morning. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I've, I've been accused by some, and and and, and upon reflection, I, I recognize that they have a great point. They do have a good point. They say that that I have worded my poll question 
poorly. Uh, they, they say, well, hang on a second. We, we don't necessarily want to drop daylight saving time. We want to spring ahead. So in other words, they like where we are now. They just don't want to fall back again. Before we get into this, do you have a position on this divisive debate? <laughs> I, I do, but uh, I want to echo what your, your uh, commentators have said, that this is one of the worries going into the fall is we don't know what the phrasing of the question on the referendum is going to be. And we know they got it wrong when they asked us previously because they only gave us two choices and they mirrored off the BC one that they put up um, two years ago in BC where they only gave a choice of, you know, stick with the spring forward fallback or stay on permanent daylight time. And they didn't actually give the option. And, and it's hard to figure out what people want when you don't actually give them all the choices. And, and I think, to be honest, if I can just speak from my own personal perspective, for as simple of a concept as it is, it's actually quite confusing. Like, if, if, yeah. you, if you ask people to sort of sort out how they feel about daylight saving time, I find myself even trying to do some math, and I'm going, hang on a second, because mine always comes down to sports. And I'm going, does this mean <laughs> does this mean that hockey games are starting way later or are they going to start earlier? What's it going to do to TV schedules? People find ways to apply it to their own lives, don't they? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it is confusing. I know uh, my wife, who she's listened to me rant about this for 20 years. She still has to ask me which one's which. Yeah. OK, so we are in daylight <laughs> saving time now, correct? We are. Yeah. And we will fall back to standard time. Is that the phrasing we should use here? Uh, that's that's the official terminology. I like the term natural time because it's closer to what we used to do before we had all this standardized time. OK, so we'll call it natural time and daylight saving time. Would your position yeah. be that we should stick with daylight saving time? I would argue natural time is better. Ah, how come? So there's lots of reasons, um, but the big there's, and there's lots of reasons for Alberta in particular. So um, just give you the general reasons first. Um, so we know from large scale studies in the States, when they've looked at, at uh, people living on either end of the same time zone, uh, the people who live on the west edge of a time zone have much later sunsets and go to bed later. But everybody in the time zone has to follow the same clock. And so they have to all get up and go to work and go to school at the same time. So those people on the western edge get less sleep than people on the eastern edge of a time zone. And that, so that's the closest we have as a natural experiment for what we will do as a society if we stick with permanent natural time or permanent daylight time. And uh, those people who get less sleep have higher rates of disease. So that's sort of the long term thing. Um, the, the shorter term, uh, and when people have tried uh, permanent daylight time in the past, and they did this in the US back in 1973, 74, um, it's, it's equivalent of us all having to get up and go to school and go to work an hour early in the winter. That's actually what we're choosing. We per choose permanent uh, daylight time over what we're doing right now. And what they find is you put sleepy drivers behind wheels of cars before their body and brain are ready to get up and commute and they have higher rates of car accidents and that's why the u.s abandoned the experiment back in uh, 1974 is and actually abandoned it earlier we're going to do a two-year pilot project and they gave up on it because they had a statistical significant increase in number of children killed in the morning waiting for their bus by car accidents and a lot of people say well it's dark it's not the darkness that contributes it's the sleepy drivers so are you oh, wow because people a couple of people have made the point that have said listen if you stay on what we'll refer to as natural time then you you've all of a sudden got uh you know a scenario where in in, in some jurisdictions you're not going to have daylight until like 10 a.m right and, and yeah the, so, Grand prairie on daylight time will be 10 20 will be sunrise 10 20 sunrise prairie. That yeah. does something to somebody as well, right? We talk about seasonal affective disorder and a lot of people that are bringing in these special light bulbs into their workplaces. Have you done a lot of digging into this? So, um, yeah, one of the problems living up here in Canada and the further north, even up in Edmonton where you guys are, you'll have more of it than in Calgary where I am because you have less daylight in the winter, um, that that does lead to these seasonal depression rates. And, and they'll probably go up because our body and our, our brain, our circadian clock is what I study, um, needs that morning light to set the circadian clock. Our clocks run a little slow and we need morning light to set it. The evening light actually pushes us the opposite direction. So by shifting our clocks to permanent daylight time, we're going to miss the, the morning light that's so critical and it's going to uh, exacerbate the problem, push us in the wrong direction. 
You took the time, uh, my understanding is, to write a letter uh, to Minister Nate Glubish, who's the Minister for Service Alberta. Uh, and, and in talking about this, you, you kind of laid out, if I'm, if I'm reading it correctly, how you're optimistic or excited about the prospect of ending what you describe as an unnecessary tradition of this biannual clock change. Yeah. You have concerns about the process and you have concerns about the likely outcome. So it sounds to yeah. me like you're optimistic but you want measured discussion because you have some concerns. Can you take us as members of the public through some of these points that you think really need to be chewed on? Right. So, well, one of the problems is um, people really haven't thought about this. And I think people think it's an arbitrary choice that there aren't consequences of choosing one over, over the other. And so I've been trying to get the message out that there are consequences of making these choices. Um, and one of the problems, I guess, for Alberta, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, is that where we are located geographically, we're actually not in the time zone that we follow. So we follow, there, yeah, that's the image. <laughs> we follow uh, universal coordinated time minus seven. Um, and that actually covers most of Saskatchewan. And we are actually lying west of it. So even when we're on natural time or standard time, our solar noon happens far too late in the day. Um, as late as 1250. Solar noon should be at noon. The sun should be directly overhead at noon. And that's what we used to do before we had coordinated time. Um, and so we're already getting later sunsets than we should. So we're almost on daylight time when we're on the natural standard time in the winter. And then right now, we're actually experiencing uh, almost double daylight time. So solar noon today will be at uh, 142. So very, very late in the day. So because our geographic location, it causes a bigger problem for Alberta. The other problem, is, and this is, this is coming in when you're looking at all the other jurisdictions. So what Alberta has been doing or thinking about is mirroring what's going on in BC. But if you look at where most people in BC live, they're very clustered around uh, the 49th parallel and BC actually fits right in the time zone that they follow. So they have solar noon right around noon and most of the people live much further south in Alberta. Most of our population lives quite far north. So we're in Calgary, it's 51 degrees north. In Edmonton, you're at 53 degrees north. So we have a large part of our population much further north. So these really short days in the winter and really uh, long days in the summer are much more extreme for us in Alberta than they are for our neighbors. Uh, so that's why I think we need to get it right and have an Alberta solution uh, as opposed to just looking to what our neighbors are doing. Does it, um, does other, it make sense, oh, doctor, to... to I mean, this, I don't even know how you do this, and it might actually create just a huge mess. But does it make sense to break from the provincial adoption of times? I don't even know how you do it. But you're saying geographically, it makes more sense in some regions than others, and it's actually quite detrimental. This practice that we've evolved, that we've adopted, uh, it's actually quite des detrimental. Do you can you, can you see a scenario where it's more based on geography as opposed to borders? So that's what they used to do. Back when they first came up with coordinated time, uh, the reason was because of all the trains uh, running in England. Uh, so they, uh, every town had their own their own time, and uh, but to coordinate when the trains are arriving and leaving, you needed to get everybody on this in the country on the same time. And people even resisted it then. So the town of Bristol, which was 10 minutes uh, later from Greenwich, uh, they actually kept the two clocks. So they had a Bristol clock and a Greenwich Mean Time clock because they resisted that 10 minute change to their, to their uh, system, but they needed it for the trains. In the US, they had over 300 different stations running on 300 different local times. And so they had to coordinate it to make it work. And sort of the, the best compromise is to have the, these 24-ish time zones that we've got. Um, and one person or one town within that time zone right on the longitude will actually have the right time. And being a half hour off either side isn't so bad, but as I mentioned with Alberto, most parts of Alberta are actually uh, up to 50 minutes off, even when you're on natural time. And when you move to the daily time, we're really, really delayed relative to what we should be. Can we treat Saskatchewan as a case study? I mean, have, have we learned something from Saskatchewan? They, they're essentially on, uh, we'll call it central standard time, right? Or, or central natural time year round. Yeah. So right now our neighbors in Saskatchewan are on the same time as Alberta. Uh, but when so we they fall back, the they switches. won't. Right. Yeah, so they don't do the switches, but they're actually on the wrong time too. So in that little graphic you put up earlier, they actually fall right in what should be universal coordinated time zone minus seven, which is the mountain time. Um, but they follow the they follow the time zone that's 
east of that. So their sunrise on the equinox is probably the best time to think. Their sunrise is at 7 a.m. The middle of their day is at 1, and their sunsets at 7 p.m. It should be sunrise at 6, noon at noon, and sunset at 6. So they're actually they're more on um, on uh, permanent uh, mountain uh, uh, time, but or they should be on mount on the mountain time zone, but they're not. Uh, and be cruel to call it mountain time zone when you can't see the mountains from there. Yeah, don't don't rub it in. Uh, so, yeah. I, are you can I, I? I mean, obviously, this would be a non-binding referendum. I'd be curious to see what the results are, and I suppose we will see what the results are. But do you think the average citizen? I mean, to be honest, I mean, I'm going to turn up and vote, and and yeah. so I, I I'll complete my ballot. But I'm going to have to do some digging and some reading. You're doing us a service now. You're helping us understand this. But I don't know if the average person. It, no yeah. offense to anyone well, is equipped to make an informed vote on this. No, I talked to the minister's team uh, oh, a year and a half ago about this long, just after that first little unofficial online poll and explained to them, I said, you need to, you need to think about this uh, and you need to get it right. And it's not a trivial thing. And I pointed out a lot of the issues. Some of the other ones I, I, I mentioned the health issues and the, the safety, the driving on the job accidents will probably go up as well. Even things like um, the ski hills in the winter, um, they can't open until it's daylight. And because they're right on the western edge of the province, they can't start running the lifts to get up the mountain until 10 a.m. when the sun comes up. So they're going to have to delay their start time. At, and right at the time of the year when we have our shortest days is the busiest ski season. Here in Alberta, we have some of the best skiing in the world with uh, Jasper and Lake Louise. Um, and, and people come from all over, but they won't be able to get as much skiing in because if we go to permanent daylight time, they'll have an hour less in the morning. So there are, I mean, there are real, there are tourism implications when, when you, when you start broadening, when, when you start zooming out, so to speak, you realize there could yeah. be very real economic implications to this. I mean, how big picture do you look at this with regards to economic implications? Well, so there's been some studies that have done some analyses on this. And because we know people are going to have more on the job accidents because they're tired at the start of their day, there's going to be lost productivity. Uh, we know that they're not going to be as efficient on the job, so we'll also hurt the economy. And, and their estimates were it was about $82 uh, a year per capita, per person, um, uh, in lost uh, revenue to the economy because of, of the effects of just having sleepy workers, hurting themselves more and being less productive on the job. I'm trying to uh, quickly do the math because I, I, I don't. Uh, so I'm just going to hear on my on my calculator. So we'll, so we'll say that Alberta's got four and a half million people times eighty two dollars per capita. So it could cost the province three hundred and seventy million dollars in economic sure. activity to make the change. Does that sound right to you? I think so. Wow. So to give people a sense, that's that's just under one percent of of the annual budget of the province. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty significant number. I'm not sure that's the yeah. type of thing that should be put to a vote. Uh, then again, no. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you, if you don't put it to a vote, I'm not sure that you have the proper factors at play with regards to why the decision's being made and who's making it. You know what I mean? So the places that are talking about it haven't had a referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, the Yukon just put it in arbitrarily last fall. They're still they stayed on daylight time, um, and uh, I feel bad for them because their sunrise was around eleven thirty in the morning. It's always hard to chase daylight up that far north, but their their sunsets were quite reasonable. They were closer to I think it was three thirty or four in the afternoon, but they didn't bother. Uh, I don't think the BCs talked about it they passed the legislation as soon as all the western states go in they're going to adopt it as well so they don't need to ask the public um i was arguing with the the minister staff just saying you should look at the facts and make the choice that's right for alberta um it's a hard thing to wrap your head around and it's a hard thing that to get the public and expect the public to wrap their head around uh and it'd be a better idea for you know get a small team together look at the facts talk to the stakeholders talk to tourism talk to industry talk to the hockey teams uh and figure out what is best on the whole for the whole province yeah i'm trying to think i mean if you look at you know even just with the hockey teams and the broadcast schedules and that type of a thing uh if if you have a battle of alberta for example as the late game on Hockey Night in Canada, typically that's an 8.07 p.m. puck drop. We're, we're talking that would be a 9.07 puck drop, right? Am I correct? If you I state... <laughs> yeah, if, if that's how they do it. Um, I mean, they would probably... You can't do that. Uh, 
Right. You have to look at when the other teams are starting and when there's a slot, I guess, in the broadcast schedule. Yeah. I mean, I just can't see that happening. So that would be too late. It, it, yeah. it, of course it would, right? I mean, yeah. it's just it just doesn't seem to work. Have you done research, I would imagine you have, into the implications on learning, like students in yeah. schools from elementary all the way up? There's a, there's a large amount of literature on this. Uh, and it's funny, some of the states that are talking about getting rid of um, standard time, natural time, are also making changes to their schools to benefit the students. Um, so we know that the later in the day students start, particularly the the um, uh, the high school students and university students, uh, the better they do. They can go up a full letter grade just by delaying the start of school by an hour. Um, and uh, uh, so, and that's the further later after sunset. Now, in this case here, we'll have uh, in Alberta and Calgary sunrise um, at the end of the year when we're having final exams at Christmas time. It's going to be 930 and our students have to go in and start writing these exams at 8 a.m., an hour and a half before sunrise. So they're going to be really hard done by. Uh, so we know that we should be for our, our students and, and, and for everybody really trying to delay the start of our day as much as possible. And we'll get the best performance from people, the best learning from our students. Kim says on, on our live chat, she says change takes time to adopt, but it doesn't mean we don't change. Kim says big companies work in multiple time zones already. So big whoop. Does she make a good yeah. point? So when I was talking to the minister's team, and, and I think they already know what they want to do. So the referendum is probably for some other reason than actually getting the people's opinion. Uh, because what they've told me is we have to do daylight time because that's what everybody else is doing. And we'll be out of sync with the rest of the world if we don't. Um, and that's not actually true because we know BC is going to move to uh, permanent daylight time. We know our neighbors in Saskatchewan are not going to change anything. They're going to stay on the standard natural time. So we basically have to choose, are we going to use the BC clock or the Saskatchewan clock? And we're going to have the same time as one of our two neighbors. If we go with permanent standard time, natural time, we'll be on the same time zone as BC. Hmm. So BC, I didn't know BC was making a change. They, they've passed legislation to adopt permanent daylight time once Oregon, Washington, and California do the same. But the, the states can't do it without federal permission. Uh, they, With their Uniform Timekeeping Act, uh, Congress has, has to let them do it. Um, the states can't choose on their own. Do you think that this is going to be part of a bigger trend? It's happening. The conversation's really ramped up in the last few years. So I, I think people are, are tired of it. We as scientists have actually been studying the effects of the spring forward fall back for a long time. And we know that that's not good. In April... There are increased rates of heart attacks, increased rates of stroke, increased rates of on-the-job accidents. So we've been arguing to get rid of it. I think as scientists, we fail to educate the public at the same time as to which is the best choice of those two options. Uh, but we, we've been arguing to get rid of it. So that's a good thing. Uh, it's just, what do we stick with? Do you think that there's, I mean, do you encounter cynicism around these studies? Like, I, I can imagine people would say, really, like springing forward an hour is causing people that have heart attacks and strokes. Really? You think the average yeah. person is, is really aware of the, the impact that it has? I think that that is getting out there because I'm, I've been hearing stories and anecdotes from people about this, uh, but they think it's just a week. It's just a bad week. But in fact, um, because they moved it so much earlier now, and now we're doing we're springing forward in March, not April. It, it's not really that you just lose an hour of sleep. It's that your body is kind of in a state of permanent jet lag until sunrise catches up to where it should be. So in Alberta, we've got lots of sunlight uh, in, the, in the summer months, uh, and, and either choice wouldn't be bad here. We'll have really nice late uh, dawns and, and really uh, early sunrises, no matter which case you choose. It's the winter that's scaring me. It's, the, it's the, the getting up way too early before your body's ready and missing that morning light that your body really craves. Hmm. And we haven't had experience with this uh, in Alberta since the Second World War. So we did actually adopt permanent daylight time for the last three years of the Second World War. And, and so nobody really remembers what that was like. And it was a different world then anyways. The U.S. tried it uh, and abandoned it in the first year. Russia tried it in 2012 uh, and gave up after two years and went back to, went to permanent standard time after two years of permanent uh, daylight time. So people have tried it and have always abandoned it. Was there something in particular about the Russian experiment uh, more recently than than the World War II uh, scenario mm -hmm. that that you sort of jumped out at you as significant? Were there a couple of factors that you think could apply to a conversation here? Well, they they have the same rough, uh, lat, or, I guess, um, yeah, latitude as us, so they're higher further north. And it was the the uh, really 
long Russian nights, the short Russian days in the winter, the people and really dark Russian mornings that they found really un, intolerable. Uh, and so in, in the US, they don't get the same long uh, nights uh, in the winter and the same long days in the summer that we have up here. Uh, so it's the Russia experiment. It tells you a little bit more about what we're going to experience here in Canada. That uh, it's going to be really hard to deal with those very, very short days and the dark, dark mornings. Some random guy on our chat, that's the handle, uh, says, hey, <laughs> it says, hey, if we're in the same time zone as massive economic centers like BC and California, I think that's for the better. Could you yeah, make that I argument? Agree. I would agree with that. I think he's got a point. Okay. Perfect. You know, it's interesting. Before we go, I mean, you're, you're an expert for almost 20 years, as mentioned. You've been studying circadian rhythms. You think the average person is even close to remotely aware of how outside factors influence the way that we feel, our health, the way our body operates? I mean, I would guarantee you I'm not. I would guarantee you I have no idea <laughs> how things like daylight hours actually affect me. Yeah, and I think that's why this, having it as a referendum, a popularity contest, is probably the wrong thing because it actually isn't an arbitrary choice, and it actually is an important thing that we need to think about and consider all the various factors when we make this decision. Yeah, I don't even know, but a, but a popularity contest, it's the, the the question or the the concept isn't even clear. So I don't even right. know what the popularity contest is for. I think some people are probably going to ask their neighbors how they're voting or which way they go, and that's if the question is phrased clearly. Uh, yeah. Which we don't want to take for granted that element of this debate. I, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not quite certain where we see this going. Ultimately, how do you think this plays out, Doctor? So people are going to choose uh, extra hour daylight in the evening. If when it, that's what people like, if 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 you just ask people, oh, I like the idea. I could sit out on the patio and have a beer in the evening. Um, I could drive home in the light. They like that idea because they haven't actually thought about the consequences of the alternative, and that's the thing that they really should be thinking about. They could save a lot of money by not running this referendum because they, they already know what people are going to choose. They already know what they want to do. Uh, there's been enough polls out there that have looked at this that people always want to choose the daylight time because they, the idea of having that hour in the evening is nice. That's actually how it came about. The very first guy to propose this, uh, William Willett, he actually was an avid golfer and he wanted more time for golfing in the evening. And, and that will benefit. The golf courses will probably do very good uh, when we have uh, permanent daylight time. Uh, but there are other consequences too on the on the downside. So the golf courses will benefit, but the ski hills will suffer. That's right. All right. Now that's terms I can understand. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Michael Antle of the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. Did we miss anything important? I mean, I want to make sure that everybody has all of the information that they need to make a somewhat informed decision on this for themselves. Have we missed anything integral to the conversation? I I think I've hit all the main points. Um, it, it's complicated for sure. Um, so, so take some time and, and look into the issues um, and consider what it's going to do to you in the winter by having to get up and go to bed or get up and go to work and go to school uh, an hour early. Because that's essentially what we're going to be doing if we choose permanent daylight time. There you go. Michael Antle is VP of the Canadian Society of Chronobiology a professor in the Department of Psychology at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute at the University of Calgary. Dr. Annell, thanks for making time for us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. You bet. Just keeping it real for something so simple, I don't know why, this conversation has always just confused the hell out of me. Well, it's, I think it, that's exactly it, is that it, it seems simple, but it ain't. <laughs> it, it, well, there's so many factors at play. Mm. And I always have to sit there and I go, okay, hang on a second. So I'm going, okay, so this is back, forward. I, I, I don't know yeah. if I feel strongly about it either way. Do you have a position on this? Uh, I love my sleep. So, uh, and I love my daylight. I, like, I, what he said? <laughs> what he said. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Sam, do you have a strong position on this? Yeah. I, I mean, my position for a while has been switching is stupid. So we should, we should abandon the switch halfway through the year. And, and then... I think that like even previous to this conversation, I was pretty set on standard time and it's and it's mostly just because 
kind of back to that factor of like, I don't want to be an island. I don't want to be out of sync with the rest of it. And, and, you know, permanent standard time. I mean, if you think about here in Alberta, and I think he laid out this case perfectly, is that we sort of benefit either way in the summer. Like, yeah, we're going to get that extra hour, which, you know, in here in Edmonton means it's light until 1130 in June. Um, so now that's 1030. But but it also know, means the sun's also, coming up at four in the morning. Yeah, which is, I mean, yeah, we're all asleep anyways, I guess. But it's like in the winter is when it really, really affects you. And like I do remember so vividly just like going to school in the morning and like waiting for the school bus before the sun is actually up. And, yeah. you know, to say if we pushed that even an hour earlier, it would be, you know, just like you'd you'd be looking out of your office window at nine o'clock at the sunrise. It would be very weird. Yeah. Donna says, so what do we vote for? <laughs> That's what I want. I want to just say, so what do we vote for? What, like ask the experts to me, the, the, the expert on circadian rhythms from the Hotchkiss brain Institute. I'm quite comfortable. And some people will say you sheep. You lamb being led to slaughter just voting the way that people tell you to vote. I'd rather just listen to the expert that's been studying it for 20 years and say, what's best for the health of me and my family? Precisely. Like what he said, he's he's the expert. He's been studying for 20 years, circadian rhythms. He knows the literature. He can talk. He can reference, yeah. you know, the studies that were done in Russia and elsewhere why the heck are we putting it in front of a whole bunch of people? I mean, the the idea that, you know, Alberta was saying, oh, well, we don't want to be out of sync with the rest of the world made me laugh because uh, what are we doing with that COVID there, folks? We take pride on being out of sync exactly. with the rest of the world. Right? Come on. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, people, yeah. So people have their own, you know, Chris is watching in from Saskatchewan. Good morning to you, Chris. Says not changing is wonderful. Changing is the worst. One of the changes is always great, and one of the changes always sucks. Truth. Right? You are speaking it's, truth. It, it, when, it, when it's one fifty nine in the morning, and then all of a sudden it's 3 in the morning, lousy. Oh, when, it, when it's, when it's uh, one fifty nine, and then all of a sudden it's 1 again, th that's pretty sweet. It's great. I so, love that. Oh, I still have an extra hour. I still Work have an it. extra hour. This is absolutely perfect. You can let us know what you think on this. Uh, you can uh, participate, if you'd like, in my poorly worded and lousily is not a good it's not a good uh, adverb, is it? Lousily phrased. My no, lousily. but I, I think it really showcases how tricky this thing is but, and how difficult it is to to communicate the complexity yeah so here's what here's what so well done if, if i were to thank you if i were to rephrase the question because we had for example audience member troy early say he didn't like the phrasing he said it was it's, it's phrased weird because what he said was he would like to get on daylight saving time where we are now and stay there right so in other words we'd be on central standard time or central natural time in the uh, well, whatever. Now I'm going to get myself into the muck and mire. But we would essentially be, you know, he he always wants to be sprung ahead. Whereas whereas the good doctor suggested that natural time is better. In other words, so the question works in that context. How do you feel about daylight saving time? Drop it, which would be the recommendation of the doctor, right? He said stay on natural time, which would be to drop daylight saving time. If okay, you great. Were, I'm going to go vote on the on the poll now. You're going to go vote on it <laughs> now that I got about what did the doctor say? Thousand and fifty votes. Uh, fifty seven percent say drop it. So fifty seven percent would align with what Doctor Antle had to say from the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. I just keep dropping that bit of credibility <laughs> there. Eighteen percent say keep it, and then twenty five percent. And I'm I'm a little bit surprised that that number's not higher. Don't care. In other words, don't care, which would could be kind of more of an all encompassing answer. Don't care. Confused by it. Don't understand it. Uh, you know, just let me know what time it is, right? And, and for most of us now, there's not even, you know, changing the clocks. I mean, you got to change some, maybe the microwave, maybe the stove, but the phones change themselves. Some watches will change themselves. How often do you just leave the, the car clock? Oh, well... I yeah. leave. It. I'll just like I'll leave it and I'll leave it and I'll I'm like and then I then I'm like oh yeah I just have to add an hour or take away an hour. Yeah, car clocks have have always been a an interesting debate in our family. Ooh. Um, my parents always set the car clock a few minutes fast, and so the idea would be that you would show up on time for everything or even a little bit early because the car clock is fast. However, 
when everybody is aware that the car clock is fast, then it's ineffective exactly. and it doesn't matter, yeah. right? So if it's if it's if it's uh, if it, you're supposed to be somewhere at ten and it's showing that it's ten oh four and all you say is yeah you know, the clock's fast, don't worry about it. Then what's the point? There really is no point. Speaking of car clocks, have you seen the new dash? Have you seen the dash layout of the new Jeep? Grand Wagoneer. I haven't. Could you describe it for well, me? Well, let me tell you. It has features like setting your clock to automatically update on daylight saving time or not. Get Just out of town. one of the many technological advancements available in Jeep's re-entry to the luxury full-size SUV class. Loop that in with the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. That's the first ever Grand Cherokee with that third row of seating. It's the seven-seater Grand Cherokee. And the rest of the Jeep lineup, you won't find a better selection than you will at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge with their shared inventories. You're going to find more options than you will anywhere else in the province of Alberta. You can link to them online under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Also wanted to remind you that the team at Local Waste is ready to fight for your business. They love talking trash. They've been doing it for a quarter century. You can find them online at LocalWaste.ca. That's where you can connect with them for a bin, whether you're in the Metro Edmonton region, whether you're watching from Regina or other parts of Saskatchewan today. Keep it local construction, commercial, and residential waste and recycle collection with local waste services. They proudly present Trash Talk every Friday here on the show. You can send us your gripes, your rants to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Also very proud to have Westworld computers powering this studio. If you check them out online, you can browse the new selection of that iMac lineup. They're back to the different colors, which I absolutely love. You can learn more about iPhones, iPads, MacBooks, Apple TV, even their music options. And of course, you can book your service appointment today. They'll ship across the country if you go shopping at westworld.ca. Coming up in about 10 minutes, we're going to learn more about what indigenous uh, landscape management looks like in the context of fire management. Dr. Amy Cardinal Christensen is going to join us. She's a fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. And to let real talkers know, before we say goodbye, before we wrap the show today, we are going to reveal the winner of our Real Talk Net Zero Solar Contest. We had more than 700 people cast votes by way of our uh, question of the week presented by the team at Y Station. And uh, we've got a winner to announce. Somebody is walking out of here today. Somebody is winning a complete solar install, getting them to as close to net zero as humanly possible the entire tab picked up by the team at Kubi Energy, and we're thrilled that so many people took the time to chime in on that. Our question of the week this week, of course, the the uh, the vote, the audience vote on our winner was a big part of it. But the question itself tapped into where you're at with sustainable energy. And we wanted to take some time today to get into the results. This is really interesting. Some some revealing data on how real talkers feel about solar Uh, about green energy, about moving to net zero, maybe some of the the factors that are prompting you to take those steps or some of the hurdles that are standing in the way. Also talking about the role that you believe government should play or not and industry as well. Sam, why don't we take a look at some of the the highlights here? The team at Y Station, they're our official research and strategy partners. They do an amazing job with the question of the week each and every week. They compile some of the, the higher level stuff I mean, these these are some of the trends that they've picked out as especially significant. How about this? Fifty four percent of the seven hundred thirty seven real talkers that chimed in on this survey, this weekly survey, fifty four percent of you believe that a transition to renewable energy is extremely urgent. More than half. Here's another interesting bit of data at a high level. Only seven percent of real talkers believe that the development of renewable energy options should be completely market driven. Just 7% believe that the market should be the sole driver of development of renewable energy. 65% of real talkers who replied to our question believe that current energy workers will be able to retrain or apply existing skills to renewable energy jobs in the future. Two out of three respondents have optimism there. And 72% of you would be willing to convert to solar in your own residence, your own business, if 
you could sell energy back to the grid. 72%. It's a pretty decent number. Some of the key findings, and and by the way, if you support us on Patreon, and we really appreciate everybody that makes that monthly commitment to join us on our journey, you can learn more about that under the uh, the Patreon link at ryanjesperson.com. You receive, our Patreon supporters do every week, the full top line report that allows you to really sink your teeth into the data and see what everybody else is saying. Um, per Chris Henderson and the team at Y Station, we're very much in the swing of what they're describing as a green revolution when it comes to our willingness to contribute to a transition of energy that we rely on to run our lives. Okay, 89%, 9 out of 10 of real talkers that responded to this think the transition to renewable energy needs to happen either right now or in the near future. It's about the affordability, reliability, and viability of those options, which I think makes perfect sense. You said 9 out of 10? 89%. That's think, wild. I think the transition needs to happen. So get this. So of that 89, and I want to be careful on a podcast and you start dropping a bunch of numbers. If you're like me, your head starts to swim and it's tough to stay focused. <laughs> but let's say 89%, it breaks into two. Okay, so we gave you options. The transition renewable energy needs to happen right now. 54%, as we mentioned earlier, said right now. In other words, there's a real sense of urgency. And 35% said in the near future. So whatever that would be. And in my mind, near future is three to five years, maybe three to 10. 89% of those surveyed are looking to ways that you can either support or directly invest in renewable energy transition. And 87%, these are huge numbers. These are majorities, big majorities. 87% of Real Talkers polled saw a significant role for government to play in terms of programs, they roll out to support the transition as well as acting as an early customer for new tech. I liked the uh, the story that jumped out at me. I don't know about you guys, but one of the numbers that really jumps out at me is the 65% that believe that there's real opportunity for energy workers. And I think that that's huge, right? You, you take a look at, at a jurisdiction like Alberta, for example, where, where I think that the, and Cal- the city of Calgary has done this in branding It's city, Mm. the word energy, as opposed to simply oil and gas. It's not a slight to oil and gas. We always have to be so careful we don't hurt anybody's feelings. It's not a slight to the the history and the present and the future of oil and gas. But if you brand yourself as an energy capital, it can be all-encompassing. Wind, solar, nuclear. What's the other one I'm looking for? Hydro. What do we call it again? What's it called? The hydroelectricity. Hydro. Hydro- There's also like geothermal. Geothermal is oh, the word I'm looking for. Yeah. There's amazing stuff happening oh, with yeah. geothermal yeah. energy in the province. Yeah. You looked. You looked like something I said raised your eyebrows, and I'm trying to figure out which one it was. <laughs> energy when we when i mean i think it cuts both ways it's kind of like tar sands versus oil sands when people talk about energy it basically makes it more palatable um i mean energy resources that kind of thing i just sometimes i feel like it's it's used to kind of make it sound less damaging well i mean we're, we're fucked without oil and gas though i'm, I'm gonna also put that out there and it is energy and it does drive like like we would be fucked right now without oil and gas. That's a fact of our own making. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but but people are transitioning. There's going to be a role for it. I just think from a marketing standpoint, why would you nail your feet to the floor? Oh, I mean, absolutely. If you look at, in I Southern agree Alberta, with you. What we can do yeah. with wind. If you look at what we are doing and can do with solar. I mean, Sam, I'm particularly intrigued by you, for example. I've seen that you, you spent your long weekend ripping out ceilings and knocking out walls, and you're doing a big home <laughs> reno. I am are doing you, that. Are, are, are you and Kelly, are, are you guys having conversations about potentially investing or integrating solar as you as you transform your living space? Oh, yeah, and I think that just because we've got a lot on the books, it's, it's not going to be this year, but like I, I, I have had quotes for solar on my house, and that was before there were some subsidies available, so I, I'd need to kind of get requoted and get an idea. Of, of, of how the landscapes changed a little bit but it's it's very very top of mind for me i mean especially since my garage roof faces south and it's completely unobstructed yeah. it's a perfect spot for solar yeah we asked uh as part of this when it came to to real talkers participation in alternative energy how do you plan to participate in the renewable energy transition 
Uh, as mentioned, two out of three, 66 percent support business or plan to support businesses that use renewable energy, which is big. You look at this, right? Like businesses will announce like we are we're, we are a net zero business or we are bullfrog powered or we are powered by Kubi Energy. People like to have those those um, it's it's uh, I know some people will say, well, there's evidence of greenwashing in certain places. Mm-hmm. And that's a, certainly a conversation to be had. But. It indicates our survey results indicate that it resonates with customers or potential customers if a business makes a commitment to renewable energy. Absolutely. I mean, I even like it when I see that someone's chosen the letterhead or the envelopes that they use are on recycled paper. Yeah. Like it's it's about, you know, furthering that brand and like what do you stand for? What do you align with? And then so corporate values, right? Yeah. Fifty one percent, more than half of you say that you, you intend to or you have invested in alternative energy in your own home like solar. This is interesting. One in three, 33 percent intend on shifting their investment portfolio to renewable energy companies. That's that's really tricky, though, because um, the, like the way that the packages are made, they have a variety of, of different, you know, some things that are more risky yeah. than others. And I went in like. 10 years ago being like I don't want to invest in X Y and Z and they were like well we can't do that there's no such thing right I'm like what yeah <laughs> what are you talking about a third of respondents as well 32% just under a third uh, intend uh, to participate in or purchase offsets like carbon offsets from third parties, companies, and governments, which I think is is an interesting one as well. And, and we have a, a conversation planned coming up on that on Real Talk in weeks to come. Uh, we asked you to fill in the blanks. I love these where you go above and beyond the multiple choice and, and leave us your thoughts. How do you plan to participate in renewable energy transition? Uh, one of you said, uh, I'm, I'm part of a lobby to challenge our current power infrastructure. Some ways to quicken renewable uptake is to have microgrids built where multiple consumers can harmonize consumption and production at a very local level. Current legacy grid operations do not allow for this innovation. Boy, have we ever had more conversation, I think, about grids than ever before. You take a look at that Texas storm and the implications there. You take a look at Alberta's power draw a few weeks ago through that heat wave and how the rest of the country factored into that. Another one of you said, I'm just trying to make small and educated decisions when it comes to my daily habits to support renewable options. One person, one step at a time. That's great. Another says, voting for politicians who support green initiatives and diversification. Another one of you said, less traveling, which was interesting. How do you think the government should be involved in the renewable energy transition? One of you said there should be a crown corporation that specifically fills holes in an energy transition if the market can't meet demand. Another said the government should procure large scale projects like they are doing and then completely get out of the way. Then let the market kickstart or, 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 or work with what's been established. Another one of you said, you know, we've been spending the last 30 to 60 years letting the market decide and, and the market doesn't care about climate change. I don't know about that says now it's the government's turn to step in and dramatically incentivize shifting to cleaner tech and sustainable lifestyles. A lot of you talk about incentives and, and, and rewards for behavior, or rewards for steps, whether that's subsidies or otherwise. We asked you to share other general thoughts with us on energy transition. We'll wrap with this. One of you said that it can be done. We need to have political will to make it happen in an equitable and intersectional way. Another said we need to focus on reducing energy use, right? There are impacts from renewable energy that also need to be considered. Another says there needs to be affordability or consumers won't transition as quickly. Costs should be reduced and additional fees need to be removed. And another one of you said it's all propaganda. If we actually think we can control Earth's temperature, we are idiots. One big volcanic eruption can cool the planet in less than a year. Mother nature will decide, not us. The beautiful thing about our question of the week is that everybody has their say, and we appreciate those of you that take the time to fill it out. This week's question, you'll find it on the question of the week at ryanjesperson.com. Last week, everybody's talking about it. The government of Alberta essentially released a plan to remove public health restrictions uh, in total by August 31st of this year. It said the decision was based on data. They've ultimately put it on Dr. Dina Hinshaw. Now, we've asked you a lot of COVID questions. We know that since the show started. I mean, the show launched in a pandemic. What do you expect? 
But this is a major development. We want to get your take on the nuances behind these measures. You will note, we worked hard on this question. It's not a supercharged, highly partisan exercise. We didn't want that. We want to know how you feel about the changes, whether you think they're reasonable or reckless, and what's on your radar with regards to consequences. We'd love to see, uh, again, strong turnout here. Get real. Our question of the week is presented by the team at Y Station, our official research and strategy partners. You can complete it by following the link at ryanjesperson.com. And our thanks to the team at Y Station. They continue to do just an excellent job. Before we move on, and I'm really looking forward to this, we're, we're going to be speaking uh, about and learning a little bit more about Indigenous history when it comes to fire management. If you want to call it landscape management or landscape maintenance, I think that that work should be a great conversation. We want to remind you, That as we talk about this pandemic year, I know that a lot of you had what you might describe as a digital experience with your studies, right? Especially for the post-secondary students, wherever you were studying, a lot of the infrastructure with regards to how you were studying was was thrown together, slapped together, kind of last minute. Not the case with Athabasca University. AU was well positioned for the pandemic because it's truly an online university. It wasn't temporary. Their, their delivery method wasn't rushed or just barely meeting the needs of students. It's what they do every day. And even when other aspects of your life may go back to in-person over the next number of months, your schooling doesn't have to. AU offers you an opportunity to do your schooling from anywhere. Maybe when the kids are at soccer practice or maybe you're in a hotel room for work travel, way easier to integrate your education into your everyday life when you don't have to work around a particular time and place. Athabasca U fits your schedule and your life as Canada's online university. You can learn more at AthabascaU.ca. Also wanted to remind you that the team at Park Power... Well, they put on our radar a couple of, uh, what did they call it on Friday? The Frugal Friday tip, which I thought was really good. They know, and they're not hiding the fact that there's going to be sticker shock for a lot of folks when you get your power bill from last month. Of course, there's been huge power draws, whether you're running fans or, or whether you're running air conditioning units or what have you. Park Power has a great option for you at parkpower.ca. It's been expensive, the wholesale Alberta electricity price. And right now, if you're a real talker, you have an opportunity to check out either the variable rate or the regulated rate option. Consider protecting yourself from price volatility by switching to a fixed rate offering. Park Power is offering flexible fixed rates for electricity on one and three year terms. But get this, the peace of mind comes with the fact that you're never locked in and you can switch rates or cancel any time. When you bring your business over to Park Power, make sure you use the promo code 2021-REALTALK. They'll save, you will rather, save $70. They'll shoot you $70 off your first bill, 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. Well, no matter, I I think I can say with confidence, regardless of where you were, uh, if you were anywhere in Canada, or for that matter, the Western United States, even in the Midwest, over the course of this long weekend, you probably experienced that lingering wildfire haze. We're seeing big fires continue to burn in British Columbia. We're seeing big fires burning in California. And it's got people talking about short-term things like we talked to dr sarah henderson from the bc center for disease control last week about some of the health impacts of wildfire smoke and it's also got people talking about broader or wider angle or longer term or even historic landscape management dr amy cardinal christensen is a fire research scientist with the canadian forest service also happens to be a metis woman from treaty 8 territory she's here because listener tracy price demanded we invite the good doctor to the show following our conversation on wildfire ai technology back on july 26th doctor it's a real pleasure to have you here we're grateful you accepted our invitation welcome to real talk hi ryan thanks for having me what a fascinating gig you have as a fire research scientist first of all i always like to ask people what got you in to your field of expertise. What was it that so intrigued you about wildfire? Yeah, you know, excuse me, I grew up in the North, I think, and there's fires 
all the time for us, not as bad as now, but, you know, I had a firefighting family. Um, my husband's a firefighter and I actually was always interested in uh, volcanoes, but I moved to New Zealand for a few years, lived there and, you know, really wanted to come home to Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 territory. And so ended up um, coming back to wildfire and, and working in this area. Did you always have, I mean, did you always, uh, whether it was through the course of your studies uh, in earning your doctorate or the way that you've approached your your jobs and your research over the past number of years, have you always found a balance uh, be- between what we might call modern practices uh, as well as traditional or longstanding indigenous approach to fire management? Have you always found that balance? Yeah, you know, for me, I would say I'm one of the people who is kind of disconnected from culture raising, um, being like uh, raised And so for me, it was when I really started looking at wildfire and talking to indigenous fire keepers across Northern Alberta that I really started to, you know, learn a lot more about fire and then even put it into practice in my own life. Can we talk about, before we get into that, because I'm fascinated and I can't wait to ask you about that. Let's talk about fire keepers and the historic or traditional role that a fire keeper might play in a community. Sure. So um, it depends on the community or the nation. So some nations had families that were fire keepers and other nations had, um, you know, everyone had a kind of a fire keeping role in their community. So when settlers kind of came west across Canada, you know, they encountered what they thought was the the wilderness, um, you know, a natural forest, but it was actually really managed by Indigenous people. And the forest that they were seeing wasn't so much, you know, a wild uh, wilderness, it was actually um, what some Indigenous people refer to as like a garden or an orchard that they had maintained in certain areas to promote their style of living. And one way that they did that was with fire. Hmm. So I imagine, uh, and and I'll qualify the question here because you're probably going to say to me, it, it matters where we're talking about, it matters who we're talking about, and maybe even it matters when we're talking about But are you able to describe what the traditional approach to landscape management in the context of firekeeping has been? Or do you have to go community by community? Yeah, it's really community by community based on their cultural values and what they're trying to achieve by using fire. But I think the overarching thing is that, you know, you're trying to promote landscape health. And then you're trying to put more fire, um, to put mosaics back on the landscape. So kind of patches of land that are either meadows or, or, um, uh, you know, deciduous stands, other things. So um, varying states of succession story, I have to clear my throat, there we go, Um, that are varying states of of succession. And so... uh, What you're doing with that is trying to, as a fire moves across the landscape, you're trying to prevent these really like high intensity or severe burns that we're seeing right now. So you're getting fire moving, you know, from kind of a spruce stand into a um, a birch stand into a meadow. So you're not getting these huge rolling fires that we see. And what we've really lost, especially in Northern Canada, is the this mosaic landscape, these patches on the landscape. We've kind of turned the forest almost into monocultures. Um, to promote timber, you know, and timber harvesting. So, I mean, it's understandable. It's people's livelihoods and people depend on that. But at the same time, we're increasing the, um, the, the, the I guess, the, the possibility for disturbance in the forest. So whether it's insect or fire. Yeah, isn't it isn't it funny you you describe a mosaic landscape and and I can think of times typically as a child, uh, which would also of course indicate that I had a childlike uh, naivety, if you will, or uh, I, I lacked awareness of what a healthy forest might look like, as any child would. But you'd travel on a road trip, for example, uh, through British Columbia, and you and you'd see landscape, you'd see entire swaths uh, that had been that had experienced fire, and you'd see it as almost a tragedy. Right. You'd, you'd see it as just like a, a, a horrific sight of this landscape that had been raised by fire when in all reality, in some circumstances, if you can train your mind to work this way, it's almost a beautiful or a healthy thing. Yeah. In, in indigenous um, nations across Canada, all of them have this similar kind of dichotomy of fire where we think of like good fire or bad fire. So the good fires are, you know, these kind of generally low intensity fires that we're doing on the landscape to clean up the forest. You'll often hear that term cleaning up or stewarding um, the forest uh, to to promote health. 
And then the bad fires are, you know, what we're seeing right now across Canada, unfortunately, this year, where we're getting these really um, severe fires coming through. We're getting smoke affecting people like hundreds of kilometers away. I mean, I live in Rocky Mountain House and we've had smoky skies now for three weeks, um, you know, and we're not near the fires. When I'm doing a cultural burn on my land, my neighbors can't even tell that I'm burning. And so I'm glad that you had Dr. Henderson on like she um, you know, has been an amazing um, advocate about wild, about smoke and, and health impacts on people. But I know that even Dr. Henderson, you know, understands that we can't not have smoke. We live in Canada. We're always going to have smoke um, from fire. It's just a natural part of our forest and where we live. The question always is, you know, how much smoke are we going to have? And when are we going to have that smoke? Are we in control of it? Can you shed some light on a cultural burn. I, I recognize that many cultural practices are private. Um, so I want to respect that, but could, could you describe for us as, as much as you're willing, what that in, entails? Sure. So for me, I mostly do, I guess my family mostly does um, kind of meadow burning or grass burning. So lots of that is actually to, you know, sometimes, you know, in a meadow, you get aspen trees or birch trees that try to start growing into that meadow um, in the early succession state. So what we do with fire is we burn that off. We, we burn the grass and it kind of kills those birch and aspen trees that are trying to come in. But on a positive note, it also really um, makes the grass come back in beautifully. And that is really good because it eliminates like rodent habitat, like mice and other things that love to burrow in that really thick dead grass. Um, but then it also can attract moose and other things to the area. And um, it also promotes berries. Raspberries love a good burn um, and lots of berries do. And the, the nice thing about that too. We might have a little bit of a drop here. Uh, obviously we're talking to Dr. Amy Cardinal Christensen, who's a fire research scientist uh, with the Canadian Forest Service. I'm already really intrigued by this. She's talking about her own cultural burn, which is obviously pretty cool stuff. And, uh, and and the thought that goes into it, what I'm hoping we can do, if we can get her back, is I want to talk about where she believes that we're most going wrong right now mm. and how we can integrate those indigenous traditions into the modern, what, what you might describe as, I mean, this is this is always the intersection. I always want to be careful with the language I use. You, you could You could draw us a comparison to when people are talking about their own health care mm. or their own medicine. And some people would say, I, b I believe in more traditional medicine and, and others would say, well, I believe in more. And how would you phrase it then? Evidence or science or data-based or research-based medicine. But you look at her, I mean, her research includes the traditions there and then the, the science there. So, so how do you find that balance? And I think people are, coming to a point in their own personal lives with regards to their health management or what they might might describe as a more holistic approach right you might go see your physician on something you may have a prescription for something you you, you may go see a counselor for something you may go to a chiropractor for mm. something i'm not going to get into the whole homeo homeopathic stuff uh obviously some people believe that to be effective and, and other people i saw dr timothy caulfield was going off on that the other day essentially describing it as a hoax so but people will find what works for them he's coming up on the show isn't he the tomorrow next tomorrow, he's morning. Up tomorrow yeah i'm looking forward to it. well this this <laughs> teased that up nicely but the same sort of approach to fire management to landscape management you know she she described as more more of our, our forests have sort of more of a uniform vibe to them um and the monoculture that, that, that the monoculture and that the logging and the you know the, the timber and the forestry industries have have played a role in that or have, have, have been a contributing factor to that. So uh, we'll hope that we can get uh, Dr. Cardinal Christensen back. Uh, Amy, of course, joining us uh, as a fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. And if it doesn't work out today, we'll get her back on the show as soon as possible. Why don't I take a quick second to remind you how proud we are to be partnering with the team at Eden Landscaping. If you check them out online at landscapeedmonton.ca, You'll be able to check out the services that they provide uh, right next to their portfolio. Whatever your vision, they will execute it with precise attention to detail. That can include edible garden boxes. If you need some excavation done, they're experts in that. Of course, look at the hardscape work that they've done with paving stone and wood and concrete tile and steel, constructing outdoor flooring and more. 
They bring your vision and turn it into reality. They don't stop working until you're completely satisfied. Customer service is what they're most proud of. That and problem solving. If you can check out Eden Landscaping right now, you'll want to do it at landscapeedmonton.ca. We're excited to have Dr. Amy Cardinal Christensen back with us. Um, Amy, glad to have you back. We were, we were just talking about finding these balances, right? I was comparing it to how people manage their own personal health care, where you, you may go see your physician, you may get a prescription for something, um, and other people may find health benefits from you know traditional healing exercises or more spiritual exercises or more holistic approaches to it. And I wanted to get your comments on, on how you believe we should manage our landscape along those same lines. I mean, I'm sure that there's some role in, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, prescribed burns and, and what may involve helicopters and water bombers and fighting fires. And where do you find a way or how do you find a way to integrate traditional indigenous approach to landscape management? And, and what might that marriage look like? Yes, you know, I think that I think you had Mike Flanagan on as well, who's, you know, a climate fire specialist and. You know, the, the big issue that we're seeing right now is climate change and causing increased fire activity. Um, but with that, you know, it's the fuel load that we have in our forest right now um, from fire suppression. So in Canada, like we are good firefighters. <laughs> we have put out a lot of fires that, you know, probably should have been burning across our landscape to reduce that fuel load. And, you know, we can't control the weather. The only thing that we can really control is the fuel. And so that's where cultural burning comes in and using fire to reduce that fuel load, but also achieve cultural objectives with the fire. But what that will take, you know, is multiple nations getting involved and multiple people being out on the land. There's a lot of forests that, that we need to kind of treat and steward back to health. Can you talk about how we get there? I mean, stewarding a forest back to health. I don't want to take any, I don't want to assume anything. What does that mean and, and how do you achieve it? Yeah, so for us, that means putting fire back in a good way onto the landscape. So trying to reachieve those mosaic landscapes. And, you know, there's good examples in the world. In Australia, they have a program called the Fire Six Alliance, which has been a great program where Indigenous people um, are using kind of carbon offsets and other things to go back on the land and to um, improve the in here. Apologies. I blame Elon Musk for Starlink. <laughs> <laughs> it's fast sometimes, but holy crap, it drops. And anyways, frustrating. <laughs> you, you, know, you know, what's amazing is it kind of slowed down and then it sped right up and then you were with us again. So I, we didn't actually miss anything you said. It just came at an interesting okay. pace. But the Australian, yeah. the Australian model, uh, mm -hmm. how would you say with regards to proof of performance, what have you seen there that, that you think you could sell the public here? Yeah, well, I think what they've seen is that they've had some fires go through areas that have been much less severe, you know, from it, they've gone through these burned areas and they've been OK. Like, you know, they haven't been losing some communities in this area, in these areas, especially in northern Australia. So, you know, it's something that we really need to look at. Like I said, fire is natural on our landscape. And so our options are really limited. We can't eliminate fire. Um, but we can manage fuel. Why do you think, uh, I don't want to, I mean, I feel like sometimes I ask questions that are, may have obvious answers, but I'm, I'm curious to know why you think we work so hard to extinguish wildfires. I'm not talking about wildfires that are encroaching on communities. I'm not talking about wildfires that are threatening cattle ranches or, or people's dwellings. That's not what I'm talking about. Do you think that there's a, a lack of public appetite or is it politically unpopular or why is it do you think do, do you think that that we need to demonstrate or we perceive that we need to demonstrate that we're going to do everything we can to stop fires is it unpalatable to the public to say frankly we need to let this one burn out yeah you know i'm just going to shut my video off sorry to see if all that good helps no the audio is great connection here but um Okay, yeah, so we'll just go with audio then. Um, so, you know, I think when colonization happened, the issue there was that um, when people came across, they were really wanted to protect, like I said, timber and watersheds. 
And so they wanted to put fire out all the time. And so it created this kind of vision for people that fire is was bad and scary. And what we're seeing right now are bad and scary fires. You know, they're evacuating people. It's super scary to be impacted by a fire. If you have respiratory problems, you know, and breathing smoke all summer, it's terrible. So, you know, what we're seeing right now is that kind of the, the bad side, I think that people were really scared about. So, you know, it's, it's really hard for people now to all of a sudden hear, yeah, but fire is great. You know, let's go back to using fire on the landscape in a healthy way. You know, for some people, it's a difficult connection to make. But I think that that's why, like our Indigenous elders are so important when you bring them in to talk about fire there amazing like I anytime that I've brought a firekeeper in to talk to an agency or to talk to local people their knowledge of fire is insane like I've had um, fire keepers all of a sudden drop you know that they were using drip torches back in the 1800s their families and so these aren't you know the current drip torches we see with diesel um, you know mixed fuel and all this and the metal canisters they were using um, tree like tree branches and sap to make their own kind of drip torches that they would then use to kind of push fires through the landscape. So, I mean, the knowledge there is just um, immense. And at the same time, the people who really actively use fire on the landscape, that was back, you know, I think um, there's always been burning in Canada. That's a huge myth I hear lots. Like, I don't know about what your comment section is looking like, but lots of people always say, you know, oh yeah, in the 1800s or, you know, back before settlement, that was great, but it doesn't apply now. There's too many values on the landscape. There's climate change and other things. Acting, you know, like indigenous people aren't actively living on the landscape at the moment. Like we know that our nations know that there are values and that burning will have to change, but um, burning has kind of been happening in secret, I think for years and years, and there's still that knowledge base there. Amy, when you've brought in fire keepers for for you know these these consultations and to be sh sharing that knowledge, has that been seen? Do you think as a somewhat remarkable step, or or do you think that that's a trend where landscape or fire management is going nationwide? Is 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 this part of the norm now, or would you describe yourself as a, as a bit of a trail? No pun intended, but a trailblazer here. Yeah, you know, I don't, I see myself in a position, I guess, of privilege to be able to talk about this and kind of bring some attention to it. Um, so I think when we when we bring in fire keepers to agencies, what I'm concerned about right now, I guess, is that this kind of romanticism around burning and, and fire keepers, you know, people are interested in them, but what it really actually gets down to is hard questions. Like who is the expert about fire management in Canada? Is it the agencies or is it indigenous peoples on the landscape that have experience? Is it both? And so, and land back, right? Like if we as indigenous people want to burn, but we have no land to burn on, you know, we can't effectively do any sort of landscape um, fuel reduction. So it really makes it, um, I think that that's the issue that we're seeing right now is there's this increasing in trend like I said, in, in the interest and romanticism of it, but we still need to kind of make the hard choices, the funding choices and other things to actually put money and, and investment into this area. I mean, this is, a, we've been looking for ways and exploring ways to better understand what meaningful reconciliation or what a commitment to reconciliation looks like. And this is, I think, uh, a pretty obvious example, but if you ask the average Canadian, what role do you think wildfire management might play in reconciliation? You might be met back with raised eyebrows or a bit of a blank <laughs> stare because I'm not sure it's the type of thing that the average person is thinking about. But but here you're providing a very clear example of why that could be exactly the case. Yeah. And, you know, I think lots of it is just a lack of understanding. Um and so that's why we've been really working. I'll just turn on my camera to show you the book that we wrote with all these indigenous fire keepers across Canada. So it's called Blazing the Trail, Celebrating Indigenous Fire Stewardship. And in it, it details, you know, um, fire, it details um, indigenous people and how they've burned. It, it tells 11 different stories of different nations right now and what they're doing. Um, and it has indigenous art featured throughout. So it's a great resource for people to go to and just to, you know, 
kind of learn about this topic. And like you said, what actually can be done in these areas. And it's also a great employment opportunity. I have a colleague, um, Brady Highway, who works for Indigenous uh, Leaderships Initiatives. And they're trying to bring back an Indigenous Fire Guardian program. Um, to so where indigenous people are paid uh, to go and do this type of steward of um, stewarding the landscape in like a, like they're doing that for other things sometimes you know like looking at caribou health and fisheries and things but you know having these positions for fire so I think that there's some great options there. Do you think that uh, I mean I, I guess I'm I'm I don't want to put you in a tough spot here, Amy. Answer as <laughs> as you're able. I mean you work for the Canadian. Forest Service, and and I know that sometimes with big agencies and government agencies, it, you know, people describe it as you know trying to turn around an ocean liner if you're trying to impact change, as opposed to the the more nimble moves that smaller organizations or independent organizations can make. Is there a culture? Do you get a sense that that that's open to integrating best practices and indigenous traditions, or is this something where you think it could be actually somewhat difficult to move the needle when it comes to the bureaucratic side of this? Yeah, bureaucracy is always fun. Um, so I think, you know, if we were solely reliant on, on like um, that, it would be very difficult. But I think what's really happening right now is that hands are being forced. So what we saw in Australia was with their big, um, 2020 uh, bushfire season where lots of people were killed. There were um, quite a few communities burned. That was when all of a sudden agencies went full bore into cultural burning, really realizing that they needed to look at other options. So innovative solutions to fire. And I, California is the same thing. Like they're having just terrible fire seasons one after the other. And suddenly there's a lot more interest. I've heard that there's gonna be a lot of funding from the California government into some of my colleagues programs down there. So I think that that's almost what's going to change, unfortunately, um, as we move forward. Hmm. I, you, you described it earlier. I mean, I just love to I love to try to imagine things. And, and you're doing a great job of painting pictures uh, verbally here. You, you talked about how the science back in the day of these fire keepers, they, they'd be able to run fires up to, for example, up to a birch grove or perhaps up to a body of water. But just for my ignorant mind here in the absence of helicopters and water bombers and fire suppressants and, and all of the other tools or resources that are utilized to extinguish burns, or at least to keep burns relatively contained uh, as best as humans can. How, how did that work back in the day? Can, can, can you give us an understanding of, of, of how these natural or cultural burns were, were contained so they didn't become completely out of control? Yeah, sure. So what indigenous peoples used was natural fire breaks on the landscape. And one of the most beautiful things we have in Canada is snow. So in the spring, um, most in indigenous burns are actually done in very early spring when there's still snow on the ground. And especially in the meadow burning and stuff that we do, you want snow to still be in the trees, but the meadow to kind of be open and clear of snow. So then you can kind of burn right up to the snow line or, you know, where the snow melt is and it naturally contains the fire as well. You know, we're not talking about setting off, you know, massive fires that are doing that candling and other things that we see. We're talking about like low intensity in, in Australia, they call them slow burns or cool burns. So like for me, I have my children around when we're burning. I have like elders, other people, because the risk of fire is really low um, of escaping. And so in BC too, I worked with some, some fire keepers from Hoiston, which is also known as Bridge River um, First Nation. And there they would use the snow line as it receded up the mountain. So they would go and set a burn in the valley and it would basically burn up to where the snow was on the slope of the hill. And then, um, and then they'd come back a few weeks later as the snow had moved further up the hill and then burn that new section. And what that really did was it allowed them to kind of control the temperature and the intensity of the burn. Because if you're burning for berries, for example, you don't want a hot burn because it'll kill the roots of the plant. You want a nice light burn that kind of removes all the dead stuff, but leaves those roots so that they can send out big, beautiful, healthy shoots. And you can, your berry picking's a lot easier after that. <laughs> Hmm. Are you seeing an appetite, do you think, from from levels of government 
um, whether it's provincial governments or the federal government, I would say this is more of a provincial government jurisdiction when it comes to you know sustainable resource development and, and fire management. Do you think? I mean, when you when you look across the country, are we moving in the direction you'd like to see us go with regards to integrating this knowledge and tradition? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we're moving, I think for most Indigenous people, it's too slow, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with everything, um, you know, and there's not enough funding being spent in the area. Um, I will say there's been so much interest that that's been really a positive thing uh, moving forward. And in BC, especially, you know, I know that there they now have like a web page on their fire agency site about cultural burning, which you maybe never would have seen before. The one barrier that we're having right now still is all the different regulations. So in BC, um, for example, it can take months or even a year to get a burn approved to be able to do. And that works really in opposition with Indigenous burning practices, where usually you just burn based on what you see in the landscape around you. So like you kind of know when it's a good time to burn, you maybe don't know a year in advance. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's one of the differences. Another issue that we're having is jurisdiction. So like you said, wildfire management is actually a provincial jurisdiction in Canada, except for Parks Canada, who has their own uh, federal government um, firefighting. But uh, Indigenous peoples, the First Nation people fall under um, federal jurisdiction and the reserves. So it kind of creates these multiple layers of jurisdiction that are often really confusing for communities to weave through, you know, who can give permission for burning and, and what. And I'm even working with communities now who just say, we don't care about any of that. We, it's our inherent right to burn. This was taken away from us and look at the state of our forests now. And we have the knowledge, we have the fire keepers. So we're putting fire on the landscape. Um, so yeah, it just really um, depends on the community that that you're working with. Are there pretend not not to like focus in on a, a tiny little aspect of what you just said, but mm -hmm. if you are seeing that trend of people saying we are uh, not necessarily compelled to observe these defined jurisdictions and we are putting fire on the landscape, uh, do you foresee legal implications to that? You know, I think I'm working with a few communities in BC. So one community that I haven't worked with, but that I know about is Sketches and Indian Band. And so they were, have actually been impacted this year by the Sparks Lake fire. And a few years ago, they were impacted by the Elephant Hill fire. So they've had fires all around them, but they've been burning on their reserve and around their territory um, as much as they can. And their uh, former chief, Ron Ignace, was super supportive of it and he actually told me that they would have people come onto the reserve and say, you know, oh, you can't burn or you need to put it out. And he would say, take us to court. And <laughs> he said that they never got any fine or anything because, you know, there is implications, um, legal implications. And I don't think anybody at the moment really wants to push it that much. Uh, but I would say that if you look at the fires, they're basically stopped at the Sketchison border like uh, of their reserve i had like a tweet go semi-viral not as viral as your <laughs> tweets probably but for me it was a lot of likes that basically showed the hot spot activity of the fire so that's basically kind of where the fire is burning picked up by satellite and it was stopped right at the reserve boundary oh yeah. here we go wow yeah, your we can, crew is on it <laughs> this this is the the mark of a good team my friend with yeah, two no great kidding. producers but yeah this is your tweet people can follow you at christensen amy and you can see this map for anybody that's watching this interview on YouTube. First Nations crews, you write, do not get the credit they deserve on fire management in Canada. Look at this hot spot map. You say they've literally stopped the fire at the Skeetchison Reserve boundary, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, was, was there one? Was there one uh, technique? Was it was that a was that a result? I mean, I know you kind of just explained it. Was that was that a result of prior burns and and management leading up to that point? In other words, was this prudence paying off, uh, or was there a specific technique that was employed there that you think particularly worked well? Yeah, so I don't know the situation on the ground 100%. I just know from my colleague Johanna Hammond, who works for the band there, but. They, so they have, I think, kept their fuel load lower on the reserve, but then also they did amazing firefighting and just their knowledge of their land and where there might be risk, like areas at risk, where they could put in fire guards that would help and working, you know, in along with the BC Wildfire Service to do, you know, aerial 
fire suppression, I think that that was really what helped. It was kind of that partnership of, of working together and the indigenous local knowledge. And Amy, to, to state something that I think might be obvious, um, but, you know, we, we talk about not restoring a culture, but a cultural awareness. I mean, you know, you, you talk to many uh, elders, in particular residential school survivors, that, that will talk about the seven generations that they believe would be required with, with regards to to um, what's the word I want to use? I don't know if there is an adequate one, but recovering from or, or, or restoring that 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 rich cultural identity, that sense of you know the language and dance and cuisine and everything that was attempted to to, to be stolen, that was attempted to be killed, quite frankly, and <clears throat> how encouraging it must be not just for you. And not just for people that understand that the history of firekeepers, et cetera, but also for young indigenous children and young adults to be able to learn these techniques and to see these techniques respected and adopted and applied uh, when it comes to what you might describe as a holistic landscape management approach. I think in this country, I don't think you can overstate the impact of that. Yeah, you know, I often refer to it as, you know, when like settlers kind of first came into Canada, what we don't talk about enough is, you know, there was residential schools that were terrible and other things. At the same time, there was multiple what we call cultural severance activities that were occurring. So my colleague, Dr. Faisal Mula talks about that, where literally Indigenous people were told one day, you cannot do this anymore. And like that doesn't only hurt like, you know, you, but then because you feel a connection to the landscape, you're not able to do that anymore. You just feel such, you know, not worth it as a person. I don't know how else to say it. So then you have residential schools telling your kids, you know, that you're a savage, that you can't think properly, you know, that you don't know how to do anything. And, and then, you know, you can't use fire, which to you is an amazing tool that you were using on the landscape. And so the impacts of that are massive on people. And when with all of that occurring at once. So now what I like to call it is like a, a, a cultural reunion. So what we're trying to work on right now is bringing back fire, but it's not just fire. It's about, you know, basically saying to Indigenous people, you know, you were right about this. You know, this is kind of how we need to look after the landscape, you were doing it right. We, uh, you're allowed to swear on this, I think, fucked up. <laughs> and, you know, now we're having issues. And, you know, so now we need to go back and put Indigenous people kind of back into those positions of, of being experts in the area. And so for me, like, as I said, my family was disconnected. So my family used to be trappers and beaters up in the Fort McMurray area probably using fire on the landscape a lot, but I never heard about it. I only learned about it in reading reports that other people had done with my family. <laughs> so, you know, for me, it's like for me too a reunion of that, you know, relearning it, teaching my daughters how to burn and how to have that connection with the land again. Hmm. Beautifully said. Um, Dr. Amy Cardinal Christensen is a fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, a Métis woman from Treaty 8 territory, uh, Sharon, who watches, uh, tunes in quite often and contributes to our conversation, says, I just want to give a shout out to another amazing Indigenous woman sharing her knowledge with respect and love. Amy, I think that's about as, as good Thanks, as Sharon. the feedback gets. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for the gift of your time and expertise today and, and shedding some light yeah, here on, on what a balanced approach to landscape management looks like tapping into these amazing and, and longstanding traditions. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. And yeah, sorry about the internet connection. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's fine. We don't sweat that kind of stuff, Amy. We heard everything you said loud and clear. Thanks for joining us. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Thanks everyone. Thanks to your team. Yeah, you bet. Uh, of course, that's Sarah Hoyle's Sam Brooks. The book is Blazing the Trail. You can Google it, Celebrating Indigenous Fire Stewardship. A beautiful cover on that book, by the way. Isn't that amazing? It's up on our Twitter and uh, it's also a link in our live chat. So. Oh, perfect. So people can uh, click the link and then what, you can access like a digital copy of the book or something like that? Or you can yeah order it you betcha okay perfect all of the above great follow-up from Hoyles uh thanks very much and uh that, there's a lot to think about there isn't it I I just think um so much to learn and when you talk about this connection to the land and this understanding of the land and I mean even the concept she says we're not uh talking about you know the trees candling and that, that was what we described 
uh, you know, with the, the, these trees that get so hot that they just essentially explode in these ripping, rolling fires. Not what we're talking about, she says. I mean, even she talks about protecting the roots mm. of these berry bushes and everything else that, that would be required for sustaining these communities. Almost like these people knew what they were doing 150, 200 years ago before people rolled in thinking that they knew better. Right? It's so interesting to see how it's not compartmentalized, how it's not just like, here's land, yes. here's fire, here's farming, yes. here's, it's like, no, 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 it's, it all comes together. And I loved the, the when she said, raspberries love a good burn. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to start thinking about raspberry and coffee and yeah, don't, don't get me started there. That's uh, I, I, we endeavor to learn something every single day on this show. And I can say with confidence, no matter where you're coming from, no matter what your perspective is already, I hope that we've achieved that. I think we've achieved that today. A shout out to our partners, our friends, the Real Talk Builders at Friesen Brothers. You know, they've been proudly Alberta grown and Alberta owned for 66 years there's 16 locations across the province. Family comes first. This business still family owned. For Friesen Brothers, providing for your family means offering the freshest food, convenient options, and healthy choices. Plus, you'll always find great savings made just for you with Friesen Brothers' personalized loyalty program. You can learn more about it. Plus, you can check out their weekly flyer online at Friesen.com. If you're ever looking on how to connect with any of the businesses that we partner with, you can find them under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. That includes the team at Kubi Energy. You know, they're proudly headquartered in Edmonton and Kamloops as well. Right now, their teams are hard at work across Western Canada, completing solar installations, industrial, commercial, residential, from big to small jobs. Kubi Energy is committed to helping you find a way to achieve your net zero goal. You can learn more about them, again, by clicking on the Kubi Energy link under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Our first show of every broadcast week, our friends at Kubi Energy also get us started off on the right foot, ready to meet the week with enthusiasm and optimism and vigor. It's a little feature we call Positive Reflections. Now, typically, this would be the time of the show on this Tuesday, the first day back after a long weekend where we dig into our email inbox and we would read stories of people paying it forward, random acts of kindness, happy accidents, serendipitous encounters, if you will. And we encourage you to keep those good news stories coming in to us. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can submit your positive reflection. But today, it's a little bit different. We probably don't have to tell you if you're a regular audience member that Kubi Energy has been working to put out what I think is one of the greatest giveaways we've ever been a part of. The course of my career, I'm talking a full solar install, getting somebody to net zero. Now, we don't know how much it's going to be worth. Depending on the finalist, it could be 12000 It could be 25000 Depending on the job, the point is Kubi Energy is providing all of the materials, all of the labor. Now, we received dozens and dozens and dozens of submissions, most of you nominating other people, where you thought a, a solar system, a net zero install could really make someone's day, could really further somebody's, well, their goals when it comes to green goals or otherwise. We had three finalists narrowed down last week, and we put them into our question of the week. More than 700 of you voted and we're happy right now to reveal the winner. With 40.5% of the vote, the winner of the Real Talk Net Zero Solar Giveaway is the Winifred Stewart Society. Congratulations to those that are involved with Joey's Home. If you're a sports fan or if you pay attention to remarkable Canadians, we probably don't have to tell you who Joey Moss is. May he rest in peace. One of the most remarkable people that I've ever had a chance to meet. Joey is the inspiration behind Joey's home. The Winifred Stewart Association works to empower people and inspire dreams. And Joey's home now will be receiving a full net zero solar install. Thanks to Tom, 
who originally nominated the Winifred Stewart Society. And thanks to those of you, the hundreds of you that cast your votes, participating in this amazing giveaway, courtesy of Kubi Energy. We'll keep you posted on the install. And of course, we'll be checking in with Joey's Home to see how it all plays out. A reminder, if you'd like to learn more about going green and how you can make it happen, you can get in touch with the team at Kubi Energy. That's put a smile on my face, and I sure hope it's had the same effect on yours. We'll be back at it tomorrow. As mentioned, Dr. Timothy Caulfield and another great weekly lineup. We'll get that talk started again tomorrow morning. In the meantime, make it a great Tuesday, and we'll talk to you soon.